everybody. This is Heather with the Mayor's Black. I am here with my lovely co-host Jackie for another episode of Artist Spotlight. And today we have the one and only Jennifer Scott of Aspen Leaf Studios. Hey, Jen. Woo. Hey. How are so, you mayors doing? We're mayors. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. Um, so I think, uh, we've had Jen on the show numerous times before we've talked about the Jennifer show, which is her show with, uh, Jennifer Buxton. We had her on for very early on in the podcast on episode 11 to talk, uh, business considerations and finance, um, in the hobby, which was a really great episode and everybody loved it. Um, and we kind of covered how the, the P's and Q's of how she found the hobby then. So we really want to get to the meat of who she is as an artist. So um, if you want to hear about the backstory of how Jen found the hobby, you can listen to episode 11. Um, and we're going to move on with she found the hobby, right? She's in the hobby. What yep. made you want to be an artist, Jennifer? You know, I kind of can't help myself. But I have to be doing something. Um, I'm from an art family. So when I started the hobby, I was young and out of money. Um, and I saw all these very cool horses. And since I couldn't afford to buy them, uh, like most people, I just started making them. Um, Carol Williams had just released the Rio Rondo. So uh, the quarter horse. Mm. And I mean, who didn't want to emulate that? So right. all of the finish work that came out on that horse was amazing. And I'm like, I got to get to this level. I got to do that. Um, this looks so cool. I want to have my hands in that. Um, so the painting is how we started. And then. Did you have the, formal training before that, Jennifer? No. Like, were you a so, trained artist at all? No, I have a, a degree in graphic design. That's about it. Um, and it was a, a little bachelorette degree. Um, it has served me well, though. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> highly yes. recommend it. If you don't know what to go to school for, graphic design is a good one, especially if you um, know that you're going to have your own business, even if it's a side gig at some point. Yeah, it, it's valuable for marketing. Yeah, well worth it. Um, and it, it that's really the only formal art training I have. Um, I, I've dabbled and shaded and coloring books and stuff as a kid and my mom mm -hmm. was always very good with color and taught me that side of it but otherwise it's it's just trial and error school of hard knocks and that is okay you do not need to degree to be playing with this stuff and get involved um so yeah did, I, did you jump right in with oils from carol i did um <laughs> and that was because oils were the thing, like I know pastels and pigments are, are really big right now, which is cool. I think they are a very easy medium to work with. Their, their shading ability is wonderful and it's great for beginners. The oils are a little tough for beginners. Um, there's yeah. a lot to master in them in order to get them right. There's the thickness you have to deal with. There's the drying times you have to deal with. Um, the blending you have to deal with, and there's a million different ways you can do it. So oils are fantastic and I do highly recommend them, but just realize it's going to take you longer because there's so many different ways to use them. Um, my I, recommendation, if you're going to go with oils as your, your first, um, I'm going to say primary medium, because you can use all of them at once, but I, I like to have a main medium. Mm -hmm. And I think the oils, if you're going to do it, start with, my advice is start with very, very thin layers. People tend to go too thick, too fast. Yeah. You're not going to get coverage all at once. Like you're in there for the long haul. So patience <laughs> is going to serve you well. Um, but yeah, thin layers. So you started, you started painting. We, we touched on that. And, um, you know, I, re I remember, I remember you starting up and getting better and better and better. And, and it's like you, you just kind of conquered, you didn't even conquer it. You kind of mm -hmm. got to a comfortable place and then moved on to trying to something to conquer something else. So at this point, <laughs> you sculpt, you cast, you glaze, there's all this other ancillary stuff that you do that goes with all that stuff. So like, I tease you about sleeping, but <laughs> like, well, I mean, did, was it a bug? Or did you just, you started painting and you're like, well, now I paint and I'm, I, I, now I have to sculpt because I want to paint my own stuff. Like it was kind of progressive like that. It was just a stair Absolutely. step. 
it did lead in like one led into the other um so the painting started and then i'm like yeah i wanted the resins were just coming a thing mm -hmm. and I'm, and their detail was outstanding so i'm like i want to make those now uh so that's it started to my journey of sculpting began and it it takes a while it's not like you wake up one day and decide you're going to be a sculptor and then you're good at it i mean it it's going right. to take you forever because <laughs> it's a skill i mean any skill has a mastery level that's you know way out of the picture when you first start so i i like to think it takes you at least five years if not ten to become mm -hmm. a true master you might gain some proficiency in there obviously between that but you're you don't know what you're really doing until you've really had a long-term relationship <laughs> with this <laughs> video <laughs> um but yeah so the the sculpting happened and then it was nice because i had my own bodies to work on i still enjoy painting bodies from other artists there are so many talented people in this hobby it's ridiculous mm -hmm. Um, so if, when I want a little variety, I'll, I'll kind of increase the pool of naked bodies. Um, <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but uh, then it got to be the point. Well, well, now I've got the sculpture. How do I how do I get it into a form that I can paint? And that became the casting side of it. So what I found out with casting is one, not a lot of people do it, and mm. two, the people that do do it are usually like far away so you have to mail this piece which is non-hardening and that's not an option um i know a long time ago people were like oh you can freeze it and then put it in like this food safe bag with dry ice and all that and then ship it that way and i'm like Egh. or yeah, you could build don't these like it. that right. sounds scary <laughs> exactly it's like my stress levels are high enough i don't need to worry about this thing getting smooshed up and shipping so did so, you ever ship to anybody else or did you just dive in and say, I'm casting? I dove you? in. I dove in. Um, Sincia was the first one. And I remember, like everybody, you never quite get the molding box sealed up totally. Ruh-ro. <laughs> 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 like you think you do, but you don't. So you're not alone if you're panicking because rubber is leaking all over your table um, and not <laughs> staying where it should be, we, we've all been there. Uh, and by the way, I do have an article on how to make these kinds of molds that I'm talking about on my website. It's in, um, it's www.aspenleafstudiosllc.com okay. and it's in the learning center. And so this is what we call block mold where it's just, you make a box out of, I like to use melamine because it's very easy to peel off and it's very easy to strap together. And then you pour, uh, you make it around your horse and then you pour rubber in and you have a block of rubber that you cut out your horse from. So when- So I, actually I, I got, a, got a quick question. Go, so, go um, cause I, I once upon a time made a plaster mold for a China piece. Uh -huh. a, a, a medallion so with you're doing the resin you're not pouring it in two parts you're pouring just just one pour and then you cut, cut the horse out in this particular method yes okay okay um but you gotta do the waste mold first right and that's pretty much what this is right. um it's just a big easy quick way to do it because you could try to put a block um like shims and stuff in mm -hmm. so you have one side of the piece that you're casting at a time but then you've got to repair the area where you put these shims in. So it's a lot easier to just pour everything at once and then slice open the two piece uh, to get your two pieces. Wow. But, um, and, and plaster is a whole different animal. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not flexible. It is hard no. to work with. You have to mix it a certain way. Um, rub, like silicone rubber considerably is actually easy because you just have to measure the two parts right you have to plug the box totally. <laughs> um, the good news is if your resin, I should say when your, your rubber rather leaks out of the box and you've only got half of what you thought you had and you still have your horse sticking out, um, needing more rubber, rubber adheres to itself. Nice. So don't panic, just mix more. You might have to run to the store first, um, but get some more and then put it in and it'll be fine. You, you don't have a heart attack at this stage of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so who taught you, Jen? I know that you're very, you're very self-motivated. 
Um, but who, did you find tutorials from other artists? Did somebody step you through it? How did you learn to mold? So actually, uh, that's a pretty good question because there wasn't much out, much out there. The internet was just becoming a thing. We had AOL dial-up. I mean, <laughs> yeah. The good old days. <laughs> you the have early that. days where um, <laughs> we got the sound. The sound forever haunts us now. Um, yep, yep. <laughs> Karen Gerhardt had just done one of her block molds. And so she had a little write up on how she did it. And oh, that, that helped tremendously um, because it kind of gave me a guide to go by. Um, and then I could fill in the pieces later with my own learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's again, what makes somebody better at what they do is practical like physical get your hands dirty knowledge you can theorize and read stuff all you want but until you actually do like you apply this knowledge um in in real basis and you, you make the mistakes um until you do all of that you really don't have a true understanding of the art mm -hmm. so the molding took many many years to get you know where i am now comfortable where i don't really have all the mistakes that I used to. Um, it, you just learn your process, learn what works for you, what, what doesn't. But um, when to panic, when not to panic. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, I think that's where newbies get off track. Like it, 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 all of it's panic, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you're starting, Basically. everything yeah. is panic. Like, what am I doing? Is it supposed to look like <laughs> this? <Why not? laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's pretty stressful at first when you don't know what to do, what's going on, if this is going to, you know, destroy your sculpture that you have worked so hard for. Um, really, the two key things with the rubber is you can always add more to it and it'll stick. Just don't mold release in between the two. Okay. So don't worry if it leaks out, just plug it and, and go forth. And then the other thing is cut cleanly. If you don't make a bunch of jagged lines right by the sculpture, you're not gonna have a problem. You can salvage the piece. Worst case scenario, you pull your piece out, you put your mold together and you've got a seam line that is just not releasing the resin. You can cut into that mold. You've still got your, your actual cast to work with. Mm -hmm. So you're fine. Um, molding is a very expensive learning curve. So be prepared for that too, because the rubber is not cheap. So yes, you can just pour more in, but that rubber is like a hundred dollars a gallon. So, oh, wow. It, nice. Yeah. I no how, idea. Much, how much do you need to, to do like a traditional size horse? For a black mold, it's yeah. like, I'm going to say up to four gallons. So Damn. Yeah, it's expensive. And if yeah. you're looking at a draft horse or it's like stretched out and it's got big mane everywhere, then you could go up to five, um, depending on how big the piece is. Hmm. So there, that's a big part of the reason that the molds are so expensive is the material itself is expensive. And then for the production molds, when you're sitting there and claying up and you've got to be really precise about everything, it's a lot of labor. It takes you all day to clay up for that one side of the mold. Mm -hmm. And then if you've got more than two pieces, then you've got to clay up again after you've cleaned up the other side. So it's a process, mm. but so, um, yeah. When you, you cast, you still, you're still a solid cast girl, right? You're, you're not doing road casting. You know, I really enjoy the solid cast pieces. It, there are pieces that um, need solid casting. Like Elton had that little attached base. Mm -hmm. You you just can't roto cast him because it wouldn't get into everywhere it needed mm -hmm. to. Uh, I also think that there are less pinholes. like because with the pressure casting, you are actually putting in air to shrink these bubbles down to microscopic proportions. That's why they're, they're technically still there, but you just don't know it. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the rotocasting, um, by centrifugal force, you're sending out the resin to the edges. It doesn't really necessarily do much with the air. The idea is that the air stays in the middle and the heavier material goes to the outside, mm, right. but it doesn't get everything. Um, so that's why on the occasion you get the little pinholes in the, the hollow cast resin. I also like the, I'm gonna say stability of it. Mm -hmm. 
it, just the yeah. hollow cast it doesn't necessarily always have an even distribution of the resin so i feel like there's weak points um and if you cast too thin then you've got huge issues uh because you can just like poke right through it with your tools mm. um and too thick well you might as well go solid at that point so right. i i just like the solid better yes it's heavier um i sculpt smaller so it's most pieces aren't more than like two pounds but yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like, I have several of your pieces, and I'm just yeah. like, they're they're a lot. They seem even um, Ilium, Ilium, who's huge, huge. in my estimation, is mm -hmm. a very light piece, and he's solid cast. Some of them. So Ilium, as actually the first handful, I think there's a, one mold that was by me, and then I couldn't keep up with orders, um, so I sent him off to MVS to finish uh, it. Okay. So there's some that are solid, there's some that are hollow. And yes, in his case, he was so ginormous that the <laughs> hollow the hollow worked for him. <laughs> yeah, because I have um I have the the black skin Nikki did, Nikki Button. Oh yeah. And so um but he's very light. He may he may well he's be probably a, a hollow a hollow cast. You can um kind of tap them and listen. Like if there's if there's no echoing sound <laughs> then he's a solid. I don't know if I want to be tapping that paint job just to see. It. You know what I mean? Just on like, the belly, on the belly, where no one's gonna see. Put like some tissue or something around before you do it, but not like with a hammer, just your finger. Yeah, you're not cracking the antic open here. Yeah. <laughs> Bored, Heather. So, um, so and then, um, after you started, you perfected the 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 molding and casting. It was time to push yourself some more and move on to glazing and making yeah. some of your sculptures um, in China. So uh, wh what leapfrogged that? <laughs> you know, China has always been a draw for me. I mean, it used to scare me to death to even be within like a five foot radius of the China table, mm -hmm. but it's like moth to flame because they're just, they're so shiny and they're pretty. Horribly and they're horribly just... <laughs> yeah. I remember they I used to be like, you in. I'm never getting shine. I'm a giant klutz and I don't need that stress in my life. And yep. you know, there's a whole Now look at me. <laughs> look at all of us. I think yeah. we're <laughs> idiots. I, I said that too. I'm too clumsy for China. I've yeah. found in a lot of cases, and I think Jackie know, knows I've said this before, that I've found resins are more fragile, especially in packing. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the paint jobs on them are far more fragile than the china like oh, yeah. it takes mm -hmm. i have almost set things on fire trying to <laughs> dremel porcelain <laughs> it gets very hot very quickly there's a yep. reason that tile uses wet saws um <laughs> but and and the glaze you know once it's on it's on it's fired and fused into yeah. the clay whereas paint you can scratch right off so but um yeah, to get into the China, it, it was so pretty. I couldn't resist. I got sucked in. <laughs> I wasn't quite ready for the molding side of it. Um, so it was get some bisques made. Uh, horsing around is great because they sell bisques and they sell high quality bisques from yeah. like sculptures like Brigitte's. Um, right. Mort had some in there. I mean, they're really nice pieces. And they were easily obtainable. They're very expensive too. So this is also a very expensive learning curve. Mm -hmm. But um, Karen, again, was very nice to show me her technique at the time, which was the airbrushing of the overglaze. And some of the things that she had learned while she was over with Donna in, um, mm -hmm. in England. Mm -hmm. So that was hugely helpful. And I took that little bit of information and then just kind of ran with it. The nice thing about the China paints is that you can spray on a layer and wipe it all off if you don't like it. Yeah. So there's a lot of learning that can be happening on getting things smooth, getting your technique, all of that. It's not a whole process because you just can do that one layer and then you wipe it off and then the one layer and then you wipe it off, but it is something. So then when you get brave enough, you can move on to layer number two. Like you can fire on layer number one, if you like it, move on to layer number two, repeat the process, mm -hmm. fire it on when you're ready. So as scary as it is, because it is kind of permanent, um, there are things you can do. You can't really sand things off, but 
I think it's taboo. And I've heard this with oils too, that people think that you can't go from dark to light. You absolutely can. It is best if you can go from light to dark, but it doesn't mean that you right. absolutely cannot do it the other way. Yes, you can. So I have taken white China paint to go over top of what I've already done to kind of um, erase mistakes mm -hmm. before. So there has been backtracking on the China. It takes a lot more effort than the cold painting. Um, so it's not as scary as you think. Like there is a little bit of a way to erase. And um, overglazing, correct me if I'm wrong, um, overglazing, it's a lot easier to see your end product than underglazing. Like is it underglazing? I believe um, almost a muscle memory thing because when they fire, they can fire out to different colors than they look when you put them right. down. Yeah, the, the China paint is what you see is what you get. Yeah. Whereas um, for the most part, there's there's some of the airbrushing technique that kind of fades a little bit. It looks like a dust color versus the true color. But from what I have heard of the underglazing, and I don't have any personal experience, that it is just like your horse might look green, but then it fires red. Um, mm -hmm. So they have like manuals and log mm -hmm. books of what color mixes did what. Uh, so they kind of had a, a roadmap of what they're going to get. And it sounds incredibly difficult. Like I have <laughs> mm -hmm. huge respect for the underglazers. They're they yeah. are smart people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I, it, I it would almost be like part. speaking a foreign language. Like you have to, and it's not your native language, right? You had to, th you have to think a little bit in the beginning about the yeah. crossover. And then after yeah. a while, it just becomes a little bit rote. Whereas with the China paints, to me, it was very, very similar to the oils. And a lot of the techniques are the same. The difference is you don't quite have the coverage and you don't have the friction mm -hmm. that are there with oils, which I actually love. Like I, I love dappling on a glossy base. It is just wonderful. It, glides across the surface. And actually I have some China paints and I'll, I'll get out a glossy horse. So you can see mm -hmm. how smoothly this goes across the surface of the piece. Whereas with the oils, I have always struggled with the dapples. Like I really like applying the paint and then trying to erase the dapple out. And I just haven't found the perfect way to do that on the oils yet. I am still, even after all of this time, I am still struggling with certain mm -hmm. things. Sure. Um, so I really enjoy the glazes because it, it lets me do certain things that I've struggled with on one medium really easily on another medium. It doesn't easily doesn't mean that it takes no time at all. It still takes a bunch of time, but it, it isn't the impossibility that it seems to be. So that's exciting. Um, and it kind of, being able to do new finishes kind of gets me revved up. But um, yeah, so the, the glazing was next and loved it. And now I'm like, well, now I have to put all my posters. <laughs> I was gonna say, now you're gonna have to learn how to cast China. <laughs> where is this self-reliant? And where is this, where is this need to be so self-reliant and kind of a one-woman show? Is it just is are you a giant control freak? Are you a quality freak? Let, let's talk about <laughs> what motivates you to do it all in-house. Do you just you know, not play well with others? <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a lot of control freak, have to do it myself um, in the beginning. Now, helping to manage a multi-million dollar company has really taught me the beauty of delegating. <laughs> <laughs> Delegation is um, the friend. <laughs> yeah, now... The horse, by the way, is not the multi-million dollar company. <laughs> Let's just get that straight. But uh, it, it just, I have to, I collect skills. You know, I collect skills like the model horse hobby collects model horses. Like I just have to know how to do everything. Like I, I, I send myself to sleep at night by researching things. So even if it's just theory, I want to know how to do it, but I, I really mm -hmm. like application. So I can't help myself. I, I have to do everything that there is to do. And I have found that that has served me well because I having that deeper understanding of how things work really helps to like, for example, um, when I worked with Briar for Hamilton, 
Mm-hmm. I knowing how their mold process worked, how they pulled things apart in the mold helped me to sculpt in a way that was easily molded, but still looked very dynamic. Um, so like we, we talk about Hamilton's tail, how all of that swirling and that crossover, believe it or not, is just a two piece mold. Sure. It just wow. Because it's sculpted to do that. Um, and then I also knew that their molding process with the plastic tends to narrow the mm-hmm. sculpture. Mm-hmm. So I sculpted a little bit more width on him. Um, and then it, it's knowing how things work that allow mm-hmm. you to sculpt in a certain way that so the end product translates more to the vision in your head. Speaking of Hamilton, let's settle this controversy right now. <laughs> How do you feel about the, uh, the blow up over the butt wrinkles? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I roll. I, mean, <laughs> I know, wrinkles. You know, I have to just laugh. I know it's from a lot of, un... I'm not gonna say uneducated because it's not the right word. Uninformed, I think. Inexperienced. Right. Yes. Yeah. They're just people that really don't know any better. um, And they shouldn't be opening their mouths about it if they don't know any better. They should do their research first. And I'm going to throw that out there. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And you should just, you know, maybe not give your opinion on it. Yeah, there's no harm in not knowing. We all start yeah. off not knowing. Yeah. Um, but I think before you go and make a big public scene that for your own um, status, you should really kind of do your research. So imagine yeah, that. Yeah, the butt wrinkle thing was pretty funny. Um, to be <laughs> it's just funny. So uh, we've talked, we've kind of talked about the medias you're using. Uh, We've talked about that you use oil paint and, and, um, and so getting further into your process, you use clay to sculpt, right? You're not doing, I could, there's a sculpture behind you, which I can't wait for you. (laughs) (laughs) I've got got grabby hands. Um, So I know you're not doing digital as of now or 3D printing. Are you working in, are you working a hard clay, soft clay? Talk, talk let me me give you the, the, Past, present, and future. Um, so the past was JMAC clay, which I don't even know if they make anymore. It was a mixture of a, a softer clay and wax. And okay. they had different firmnesses. I think I used the firm, which I, I consider very soft. Now, that was to get in. It's a good beginner medium because when you're a beginner, you're really correcting things all the time. You know, you see it, you wake up the next morning, you see it differently, and you need to change it. Mm -hmm. So having something that's pliable is great. Um, I would recommend now, I think I, I, it wasn't a thing back then, at least I wasn't aware of it, but the monster clay I've heard really good things of, and that too comes in different firmnesses. Um, If you're a beginner, you want something that is soft enough that you can move it around pretty easily, but is firm enough that it will hold the details and you can't just accidentally squeeze it and then lose everything. Mm -hmm. So what I'm working with now, um, with all of this, like I I worked with the JMAC, I worked with Super Sculpty at one point, which I think Brigitte uses, Brigitte April. Really? Um, uh She still uses it. If you look on some of her her pictures of her sculptures, you'll see that they're that Super Sculpty pink. (laughs) Yeah, that's crazy to me. I feel like, I feel like, I mean, with the, people turn out beautiful stuff that way, but I feel like it's so much work. Oh my gosh. It's actually pretty cool. The hardest <clears> part <throat> with the Sculpey um, is it, it doesn't like shove without mm. leaving a textured trail behind it. So there's, there's no smoothing of the clay. Um, you kind of have to use a metal tool and like roll it like a rolling pin if you want to move clay from here to there. Uh, but actually it, it is just firm enough. Like there's benefits to the Sculpey, like you can fire it, um, or not fire it, <laughs> bake it so yeah. that it's firm and then you can sand it. So it, it kind of has the best of both worlds where it's not hard until you want it to be. But 
I moved on from there because I, I didn't quite get the feeling that I wanted. And what I'm using right now is a Chivant play. It is mm. called CM-50 for those. And I know a lot of people always want to know what I use. It has sulfur in it. So you have to seal before you put the silicon in because sil sulfur is a cure inhibitant to silicon rubber. Um, in fact, you can't even use, there's two different kinds of silicon. There's a tin cure and then there's a platinum based cure. And you can't even use the platinum based cure because it, uh. it just, even with a sealer, <coughs> as a barrier, it will not cure. Um, so you want a tin cure rubber with a good sealer in the middle if you plan on using this. What I mm. like about it, because it's industrial, is that the clay particles are ground so fine that sometimes when you use clay, you get these like little rough nubbies in the texture. Yeah. And the industrial clay doesn't have that. Its application is meant for like, they sculpt cars out of these, the pr car prototypes, and then right. mold the fiberglass pieces from those. Mm. Um, it's very, very smooth. There, I, I like it because it's not quite temperature sensitive. I think you have to get to like 135 degrees before it starts softening. And that means in the heat of the summer, it's not going to get oozy. So okay. sometimes like, the clay, like the J-Max with the, uh, the wax in it, in the summertime when it got hot up here, because we don't have AC. So in the worst of the summer, it'd be 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the sculpture starts getting a little droopy. <laughs> 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 so Ooh. with this place, uh, it, that doesn't happen, which is nice. Um, it doesn't get any harder in the winter. So it stays pretty consistent. It is extremely hard to shove around. Like I have man hands because my, my fingers are so strong from moving around this clay, from molding, from everything. So it doesn't matter to me. And I'm not really shifting the clay around a bunch like I would as a beginner because I mm -hmm. my eye is further developed. Uh, so I really like where it is now. It carves very nicely. There's to me two different styles of sculpting. Those who like to sculpt up, like they build up muscles and then those who like to carve down. And I'm mm -hmm. a carver. I, I like to have a big old block of clay and then whittle out my piece. Nice. Um, and this, this clay whittles out very nicely. And the firmness is great. And then I can use a solvent. Um, I use turpentine. I know that some people can use olive oil, uh, mineral spirits works fine, any of those kind of things like paint thinner type stuff you take on a soft brush and you smooth out. So I can make it very, very rough and textured and then soften it down to the point that I want with the solvent. And it, it gets these beautiful textured horses that, that nice. look mm. like they have innards and flesh and as Sarah terms it, goo yeah. um, very easily, which is nice. What, what drives your POV on sculpted pieces? Like what, what inspires you? What, what makes you go, I want to sculpt? Is there under, like Lynn Fraley has underlying, her horses tend to be political in some cases, mm -hmm. right? Okay, Seneca yeah. was a political K, uh, piece. There were a couple of others. What uh, is yours just pretty horsey? You want to sculpt? <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I just, you know, usually what will happen is I'll go browse through all these images and I, I take photos of my own too. Like I, I ride the real horses and I go to the events and I'll take snapshots and I'll see this image that I'll be like, dang, that would be so cool as a sculpture. I got to make that. Um, so I, I really, for me, it's just more of a, a visual impact that hits me. I couldn't even explain what it is. I like dynamic pieces that where it's it's like contained power mm -hmm. um so a lot of the performance horses where they've got this this power but it's all wrapped up in this package ready to be used and that just that's cool to me um so I tend to go with those pieces I like to try to get like character I I don't want a dead sculpture um mm -hmm. I don't want an anatomical teaching piece you know I I want it to have some life to it so it doesn't always have to be the high level performance horse it can also be a horse out in the field um like I, I love mares too 
uh, I just love mares. So a lot of them, they have all of these little facial nuances. And I love trying to capture that, like to, to try to put the real thing into something that's so small, but yet still invokes the same kind of feelings that the, the live horse did. Mm -hmm. That to me is so amazing. Mm -hmm. like, it, it just, I can't even put it into words, but I it keeps me out. I think that's one of your great strengths is your horses have lots of anima. Do you know what I mean? They have expressions. Yeah. There are, there are some pieces out there and don't get me wrong. They're beautiful, beautiful pieces, but they're a little static, you know, they're yeah. a little, uh, statue in the middle of the Palazzo in Rome type thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a great don't even, Some it. of those have lots of fire too, but you, you it, it's, it's, it, you got to kind of work some personality into to some of them. And sometimes painting solves that, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think the facial expression is a big way to put, the, um, to get that into a piece. Cause it, it leads you to do the question, like, how do you do that? Um, the ears tell you something, the pulled nostrils like mare face is great i see that yeah. one all the time is my boss mare you know picks on my two little girls <laughs> um and and their nostrils get pulled back their eyes kind of narrow their ears go back their whole face gets pulled and it's just it's being able to read that expression and then put it into your sculpture without overdoing it yeah um, right. because if you overdo it you get into the cartoony side but then it's also knowing body language of the horse too, not just the facial expression, but like, so yeah, <laughs> as our fat would yeah. is nodding vigorously yeah. at me. <laughs> well, cause I, I see a lot of pieces that the face is saying one thing and the rest of the sculpture is saying something else and mm -hmm. people yeah. misinterpret it, you know, like, oh, the ears are back. He's listening to his rider. I'm like, not like no, that. No, he's, he's mad. Not. Like, <laughs> <laughs> look at no. the whole rest of him. Yeah, I so that's a great, Let's use that example. Like, yeah. let's say you've got a dressage horse in a trot. His ears are back. Um, if you see like a big under muscle in that neck, he's resisting. Yep. You know, he, he's not actually listening to that rider. If you see stiffness in the body, he's not listening to his rider. If you see a hollow back, he's mm -hmm. not listening to his rider. Yeah, so he's unhappy there, about something. Right. There yeah. are other factors, not just the face, like it's all the horse communicates through its entire body. You know, a swishing tail, that can be a number of things. It can be playfulness. It can be, there's a fly on my butt. You know, it can be, get the F away from me. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be, I'm annoyed. It, it can mm -hmm. be so many things. So I, I think just studying, like just looking at horses out in somebody's field, it doesn't even have to be your or own. your field. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was going to ask the question about your horses influencing your work, but clearly you've answered yeah. that already. That yeah, you get a, yeah, you get, you they're huge. A of education from from your Morgans and Mir and the horses that you've had. Yeah, and it's you know the riding has helped a lot too. Sure, because sure the riding you can feel it. Mm -hmm. Like you can't really feel how a horse moves in a canter unless you're there with them. Um, so the riding gives you that ability to do, um, you can now I'm schooling and I ride dressage, dressage and, um, hopefully now eventing with my, my young or not young anymore, my girl, Ivy, mm -hmm. she's going to be my eventer and you can feel when the movement is right and comfortable mm -hmm. and natural, and you can feel when the horse is tense and angry about something. So that has helped knowing right and wrong um in how to put it in the sculpture as well mm -hmm. so it, it they're huge i really think it's not necessary to own them but it really behooves you to go and be around them mm -hmm. so speaking of you know real horses and your your process how's about a little studio tour absolutely so you mentioned that I don't sleep at night or how do I <laughs> sleep at night? Well, ever. Um, just as an aside, reason. Jen also just posted this beautiful quilt that she did on Instagram. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> I, where, like what? These, these need to be active at all times. But 
The reason I have time to do all of this is because I don't clean. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that saves a lot of time actually <laughs> do you make that clean what's up yeah so um it's gonna be a studio tour but as we go from like room to room you might just get the big you know nostril face that <laughs> you don't see anything else <laughs> so um i'm going to see if i can flip this around and i will show you the casting room Woo. Okay. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah. So this is this is, makes me feel so professional. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this looks like a science classroom. Like yeah. the whole this, I, I love I, it. this only happened this summer. So mm -hmm. I I just had so much crap piled into this room that I had to either get rid of it, which I can't do because it's all supplies that I need at some point, or I had to make space for it. So um, I Marie Kwand this room and highly got things organized. Uh, this particular space is the workbench. Um, it, it's fantastic. I have things like cups and all my mixing bowls up in these cabinets. So like these are, I use knives um, to make, yeah, those are my resin mixing bowls. They're great. Uh, these guys, the little cups are great for like water cups and stuff and little tiny things. They're a little bit more liquid friendly than the paper cups are. Mm -hmm. um, so usually what I do with the paper cups is I have, you can see my mixing knife, um, the resin gets kind of poured into the cup. Sometimes I have extra resin and that's, I'll just pour it into a new cup so that it, it forms this like liquid barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it's, it's very watertight. Nice. Um, and then I have all of my tools. We've got the paper towels. We've got all the little handy things that I'm grabbing. Um, mold release, all of my, uh, wires and stuff that I'll need for bending or pliers for bending the wires. These go, all these different gauges are in the legs of the cast mm -hmm. resin. For support, let's see, we've got, this is the super small wire for the little guys. Um, this over here, these are tints for resin. So if you want colored resin, most mm. of those happened at the Jennifer show to get all of our little colored medallions. Nice. Uh, these are the shiny powders you can put on top of that. So you'll actually like paint those into a mold and then you'll pour your resin in and it leaves the huh. shiny finish on the top and it's awesome. Uh, miscellaneous little things, brushes uh, to, let's see, pounce in the baking powder or baby powder rather, which is a necessary item in the mold. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get back to these guys. Because <laughs> we're going to do some special stuff with those. I've got storage for some bisques and some glaze works in progress, which we can pull out in a minute. That's and then a Stella the bisque. Jello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've got some big cabinets, um, some projects that you just got to peek at that we'll, we'll talk about in another minute. And you get to see my face again. Yay. Hey, and you don't get to see my floors because we have St. Bernard's and their hair is everywhere. <laughs> we have three cats. I get it. Very, yeah. very cats. This is the painting station. It is separate from the molding station because I, I just need somewhere to keep clean. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's not clean. This is real <laughs> life, by the way. <laughs> so people that think you need like a sterile room to paint everything. Um, here is your, your live evidence that you do not. <laughs> but yeah, I have a clean space with paper towels. These are where I put the horses for painting on that I'm working on. Some of the more immediate pieces like do No, what's his name? Um, Dibley. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go just kind of tucked out of the way. Uh, I have moved everything because I was taking pictures. I think this also, this little magnetic bar right here, mm -hmm. I have that background that is rolled up uh, and then I will unfold it and then just pop it in with the magnets so that it drapes. And then that's my photo area as well. Nice. You're so, so close. 
<laughs> I, I have the spaces. Well, I know how to make, I, I like to think of myself as a master of efficiency. I know how to multitask like a boss and I know how to make like cram as much crap as you can into one little place. <laughs> my, my husband probably hopes that I would become less efficient at one point, but I can't help myself. Um, so these guys are Ooh, sort of work in progress. I you see one that looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and then these guys are all in various stages of completion. Are these fest horses or these commissions or a mix or? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. And, and they might not be this year's best horses. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so I have all of my China stuff here mm -hmm. and let's see. So I've got the stuff that I have mixed. Well, let's start from the top actually. So China paint comes in a powder form mm -hmm. and then you use these mediums uh, to make it into a paintable form, which is then um, these bottles over here are actually a ground down. Like I used uh, mortar and pestle and oh. they're ground into a very fine, fine, um, dust so that it, I can then sieve them into these bottles to then go through the airbrush without leaving splats. And that's oh, yeah. um, how to make a, That is not easy because airbrushes no. are mega picky. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. And it, like, I can't put this through, um, that's my micron right there. I can't put it through my micron. I've got this guy, actually two of them. So I have a China one, which is kept really clean because the Chinas are, they stay liquid. They wash away with water really easily. So they never really clog. Whereas mm -hmm. this paint one <laughs> is a different story. It likes to clog all the time. Um, so I have to clean it all the time. So it just became easier, you know, for a hundred dollars to not have to constantly um, get through the paint and cross contamination. It was just a good move on because I do enough of them to get yeah. its own brush. Nice. And that, that has been a lifesaver. Nice. Um, but I've got pigments, new pigments I just acquired. This is my mixing um, thing. I, I have a, a little bit of a mad scientist in me. So I always get new stuff to play with to see if I like it better or if it achieves right. mm -hmm. uh, something a different way that I was doing before. Um, let's see, these Liquitex, or not Liquitex, um, golden liquid paints. I think they're high flows. These are great for the airbrush because they are, they have the proper mix. So all paint is a, a mix between the pigment itself and a binder. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the amount of binder to pigment kind of makes the thinness or the thickness of the paint for a particular application. And these are great for airbrushing because you get the pure pigment without it being like washed out or too watery mm -hmm. to the point where it doesn't flow properly. So I highly, highly recommend these for your airbrush. I used to use these versions of the golden, um, which are still fluid acrylics, but they're not the high flow. And mm -hmm. then use the medium. To dilute them. Yeah. To dilute them. And it worked. I mean, I was still... and. For the most part, I just use this as base coat, so it wasn't a big deal. Every once in a while, I will use something on a top coat to just smooth an area that I'm having trouble with. Mm. Uh, it saves a little bit of time rather than going and using four layers of oil. Right. Um, so highly recommend the fluids. And then these are great for markings and stuff. Or if you just need a little bit like a hand application, those are great. Mm -hmm. um, various things like glazes, retarders, if I wanted the acrylics to dry longer. Um, I've got some, you can't see it, but it's some varnish. Mm -hmm. So I'll paint the eyes and hooves with that. Miscellaneous tools I didn't know what to do with. I think that's a can of primer. More pigment. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my Dremel. Um, this is kind of a little tray that I got. It's probably the top two drawers are the most important. So I've got all my oil paints on that second tier and I've got all of the brushes, miscellaneous stuff. So these are more of like the colored pencils and the pigment mm -hmm. brushes. These are more of the actual hand painting brushes for the oils and acrylics. And then this drawer is more for prep. Um, so it's got a lot of needle files. It's got my carbide scraper. Um, yeah, I, I think 
Lights are a big, big deal. I think I cannot remember, think if it's true light, but I highly recommend these. They are super bright, um, but light is so important when you're painting to get a nice neutral light, something that's not mm -hmm. too yellow, not fluorescent. Right. So you can see the actual colors you're painting your piece. Um, do you have, Jen, do you have that book when I was there and you were showing me uh, some technique? Do you have that book where you you have your uh, colors broken out? Oh, yeah, yeah. That guy is right there <laughs> with Rio Rondo cards. <laughs> yep. The Angry Birds book. Angry Birds book. <laughs> so you guys can get a peek. Um, there's no secrets here. So like I'll have a... Um, a I work in colors of three, we'll use this guy. I don't recommend this, it is kind of a failed color. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where's my more recent ones? Cause I have, I started putting in, yeah. Yeah, I was so gonna I started say, putting in, go. Watches in little blocks. Um, so these are great. Uh, this is the classic champagne. So I've got like my highlight color. <laughs> Um, I've got, in this case, this one took more, I, I tend to like just to highlight a body and a shadow color. Um, but he has points for the champagne, you know, some skin tone. And I tell, I have the list of how many parts of color I needed directions. Um, and then I list examples. So mm -hmm. it's, it's my little log book and it's nice to have. I highly recommend these. Nom, nom, nom. Certain, yeah, I, I wanted something fun and I love green. So anything that's like this light <laughs> green color goes into my studio. <laughs> that's nice. awesome. But, uh, that's pretty much it for the paintwork. I have my Mac, which is right there. Um, Hi, Mac. <laughs> a lot of the magic happens there. That's all of the research that is getting... Uh, when I have a color in mind, I like to get reference photos and especially for patterned horses. Let me put this back and hopefully it works. That's good. Um, yeah. um, so right. the pattern colored photos, you, you really should be getting when you paint a horse in order to get it truly accurate. I think it's important to have as close to the real thing as you can in front sure. of you, which is going to be a photo. So, okay. so yeah. I, I'm actually going to just interrupt because I need to step out because I have uh, I have another engagement. Sorry, East Coast time. Uh, but thanks, Jen. Uh, yeah. hey, we'll carry on from here. I'm glad we got to talk again. It's I'm, been a while. I am glad to. Yeah, it has. <laughs> I'll, 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 shoot you, I'll shoot you the reveal <laughs> later when she does it. Okay, please do. <laughs> have fun. I will. All right. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye, Jackie. <laughs> All right. Jackie had to take off and abandon us. So we will we'll carry on with uh, Jen Scott of Aspen Leaf Studio. Uh, we are, we've gone through the studio tour. Are you, uh, is that done or do you need to show us more stuff? No, there's no more. <laughs> That's so all I got. <laughs> so uh, what do you, want, what would you like to talk about now? Do you want to talk about work in progress? I want to give you the reveal okay. um, because ready. it's going to lead into how we made said reveal uh, okay. because we're on a bit of a time frame with it. So okay. I don't know if you heard the alarm like early in the episode no, I did or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're still in safe time right now, but any longer. Uh, so I am going to do a without further ado kind of thing. Okay. For uh, Briarfest, I will be doing a limited edition medallion in porcelain with no glaze work whatsoever because it came out so beautiful. Um, it was originally just something to custom glaze for me, and then I saw how pretty it was unglazed, and I'm like, we got to do a run of this. So, so it's just going to be big Potter, surprise. Whiteware. It is whiteware. Big surprise. Um, it is with Kylie Parks. Oh my god. And Shermagird. Oh, cool. It is Cyclone. And I he just came out so absolutely beautiful in porcelain. Do the tap. Like, so I, I just. On. So he's got his thing. 
or his name rather and then his saying yes. and he's just he's so pretty so this one does not have the one of a hundred on the back because it's going to be a custom glaze piece um we we did want to spatter some of those in in the edition right so it it'll be the bare porcelain will be the 100 made that's it Mm -hmm. And then the rest, it'll be the unlimited, uh, except for my time, because, you know, I get like four Chinas out a year, if that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, there will not be like a hundred of the custom glazes running right. around anytime soon. But um, I'm very excited. And, and for the first several custom glazes, I want to kind of play off Kylie's theme of the Oz. Oh, so man. I want to do, you know, like a bay with the yellow background for the yellow right. brick road, you know, and there's, I have so many ideas. It's so many ideas. Are you going to do any decorators? Do you have thoughts yes. on doing decorators? Yes. So hopefully time allowed, I really, really, really want for both Kylie and I um, to have plain, not plain, but just solid colored uh, pieces. Right. And we want to do these as giveaways, <gasps> right, throughout our events. <clears throat> yeah, so everybody like fan themselves. <laughs> we, this is a huge goal of mine. There's there's a lot to be done, but we really want to just have something for people to enjoy that they don't have to pay for. Right. You know, because yes, we might sound me especially. I, I think that I come across as I'm a bit mercenary. And sure. it is a business. It is to pay for things. Uh, there's a lot of labor that gets put into these guys. Like a lot of labor as you're about to find out. Um, Cause we're going to make one, <laughs> but it, it is a labor of love and we appreciate our customers so much. So, I mean, we can't do this without them. So we want to give back in a little bit of any way we can. That is, that is beautiful. I love the sound. The little. Is it? Can you like. <laughs> Sound of, I love the sound of bisque. This thing is so freaking strong too. Like this is cone nine porcelain. I mean, I could probably drop this and it wouldn't shatter. It's right. just, it's got the strength of steel. It is amazing. And it's big too. It's what? I'm surprised it's so big. Um, I was just about to show you. This is the resin and it's got some clay on from the molding. Um, so this is the size of the resin, mm -hmm. and then this is the size of the porcelain. Wow. So you can see there's that. So it's know, about 13%. what? 20%. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna go by and say twenty percent loss, but yeah. But you can see, like, the detail is pretty awesome. Yeah. So I, I'm that is so cool. I'm stoked for this. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. That's amazing. Absolutely. It, this was such a fun way to reveal it. And while I have you guys um, with speaking of porcelain, before we jump into how these are made with oh, the Oh, stop. Sorry, I'm like, got my little wheelie <laughs> stool that's not wheeling. So. Um, this is what the porcelain tadpoles look like. So I know so, that- Oh, I have one. He mm -hmm. doesn't have a base. No, you have one of the four that were tests from- animal artistry which were bone china but okay they were off base so the porcelain and he still got some of his um silicone or silica in there to keep all the the props from sticking mm -hmm. that he got um he for his his real edition he is going to be mostly on base there will be a few exceptions but in general i like the bases i think they are just a nice little way to elevate the air um, so that it doesn't just look like a horse that's kind of floating there. Uh, it looks like a showpiece to me, like a fine art piece. So I like the bases a little bit. I better. like the stability bases provide. Yes. I mean, not that Tadpole, he's got four down, so he's not going to have a real issue. Right. But <laughs> this is, is a, that's a lot more safeguard right there. You know? Right. So you've got like, instead of this amount, you know, of space, you've got right. that amount of, yeah. But this is what he looks like. Um, as far as the color, think Joni's earthenware. Uh, he is the same color, that nice warm white. So he is not the the bone white that Bone China has. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's going to be great. Uh, he's going to be really, really nice to glaze up, and I'm so excited. He's so cute. He is cute. I love him. And he's he's a good little size too. Um, 
I, I like the way that they came out. He's probably the same size as your bone china because they shrink about the same way. Yeah, he kind of looks like it. He looks, if I'm being honest, he looks um, maybe a little bigger. We'll maybe it's a, but maybe it's the base that makes him look bigger. It, I was going to say, I do have one that's off base and he looks so much smaller because this little tiny bit of rays, mm -hmm. it really does make them look so much bigger. So um, there's, there's my grill, grill you one. There was the Palomino Pinto you did. Uh huh. There was a white wear one. Is that yep. correct? So I glossed one for Kylie because glossed, um, there's just something about glossing a piece and not finishing it anything, but the bare clay body that brings a sculpture to life. Like you see every little detail of the sculpture itself. And I really wanted Kylie to have that. So she's got the glossy whiteware. And then there's one that I finished last year, I think before Briarfest, I'll have to check. It's on the website, um, but it is a really light uh, kind of buttermilk buckskin, but it's got the really oh, yeah. variegated mane yeah. and tail. That's yeah. so pretty. Uh, I saw a Shetland in that, like there's a, a real horse that has that color and it's gorgeous. Like the mane and the tail, that was the inspiration. I knew, I knew Tadpole with all that mane would be perfect for it. We, we, have you ever thought about having gladiator matches for people that want a tadpole or custom <laughs> get, get them those big foam, you know, sticks yeah, to beat each other with. Some pool noodles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that would be entertaining. We'd have to live that. <laughs> <laughs> Please, like, 40-year-old chicks going after each other for a china horse. Oh, it. It'd be vicious. It would be. <laughs> You ever seen the Ninja Pit of Death? Uh -uh. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of right now. <laughs> like, you know, we'd have to have ambulance trucks lining the place. But um, let me get to, because I mentioned before that we're on a bit of a timeline. We are going to, I'm going to take you through how to make the Cyclone Medallion. Nice. How it, it went from resin to rubber to plaster. So get out some pieces this here. This is so amazing. Thank you, Jen. Absolutely. I love this stuff. And, and video is perfect for this because you get to share everything with actual footage of what you're doing. Like it's not just a description. You get to see what it is. So this, all my rubber bands, um, which you'll find out this for later. This is a very used rubber mold um, and is a mess and dusty because I've been cleaning greenware here. But what I did is actually, I'm gonna take the resin. So I will have the resin sitting on a board and then I'll board it up and I'll put rubber on top of it. So that gives me a negative space. Um, from there, I will actually, let's see, cast around that piece of rubber. And I don't know that I have that available to show you guys. Um, but around that one piece of rubber, so now I've got a mold of this. So like if I were making more resins, I would use that mold to pour right. out. But instead of using that mold, that's actually now my new space that I'm going to then make a mold of further. So it's called a block and case mold. So you've got your, your one mold and then you're going to make your block mold and then you're going to make a case around that. So this piece right here was the piece of the resin. And it's got plaster in it, but you can see it's oh, wow. the negative space yep. of that mold. So that then allows me to pour plaster. So the plaster, um, you have to, with Cyclone, because he's got these kind of curves right here, what happens, so, Slip, um, which is our clay body, our liquid clay body, is right. not just mud and water. Slip is actually a mix of the clay and then um, a mix of, and I'm going to get this wrong, but um, <clears throat> something that controls the firing temperature. Um, Christina and Joni are probably both like, <laughs> I can't remember that part of it, uh, but it's the clay, it's some other stuff that controls the firing temperature. 
Um, and then it's got like a little bit of water. It's a little percentage compared to what you think, like 10, 20%. Yeah, I've um, seen uh, Christina make slip and like, it's, it's a whole nother it's thing. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's actually the new piece of studio equipment I want to get is a slip casting table, which is pretty neat because then I can make my own slip and that's actually in the plants too. But um, the magic ingredient to slip is called a defloculant. And so what it does is it has all these little particles in the mud and it changes the charge on those particles so that they're all negative. So all these little clay pieces in there no longer like each other. So they're trying to stay away from each other and get in their own space. So that, can, that makes the clay universe, like the body equal, no matter if it's at the top of the pool or the bottom, because otherwise gravity Cause, would just- Because they're, just all, trying to, they're all trying to repel each other. Yes. So that's the magic ingredient on, on what makes clay into slip. Um, so you have this very uniform floating mud. <laughs> so now we've got our, our mold. Um, I, because of what I was going into with his uh, little holes in the name, because of the way that slip, um, the plaster will wick out the, the water in the slip. So you pour, I should probably just, we're gonna go in as good of an order as I can go, but um, I'm gonna show you the plaster mold so you can get reference points. But what happens, so this is the plaster mold. What happens is you would pour um, the slip into there and then the plaster sucks the water content out of the clay, which causes it to stick and harden and form a solid line against the wall of the mold. And then you would pour out, like you wait till the thickness you want is achieved, and then you pour out the rest of the slip and Do back into the have, Is there any sort of release or is it just a natural release? So for, for the plaster um, or the porcelain rather, I have found I need to dip my mold into vinegar, which is also a deflocculant. Um, in order for it to like really release from the mold. Otherwise it tends to be a little sticky. With earthenware, I haven't found that. Mm. It, you can just release it from the plaster, no problem. But, um, so you have these pieces here. This is the negative of the, the mold. So <clears throat> it is backwards per se. Mm. And the slip shrinks as the water gets removed. So with these holes, you have a certain time that the clay is shrinking. Um, you can't leave it in there too long. Otherwise it starts to crack around these because it can't shrink, it can't pull itself together um, because these are like little columns that are holding it apart. Is so there happen it's two pieces? This is two so that I could pull it out because this is a lot of area, even though it's just a flat lift out. Um, there's just so much swirling in the main and everything that it was much easier to just pull out the two pieces of. So you'll see when we pull out in a minute. Okay. Here, we're gonna actually go through this process together. Like we're gonna make one of these, but I wanted to kind of get you oriented on what we're doing, why we're doing it. Right. So, so these, cool. Yeah, these pieces um, I poured, <sighs> I have my rubber piece because you know this was the original rubber that went over cycle. Right. I cut it into two. Normally, you would then smooth this wall or smooth the plaster that you got out, but this was smooth enough and I figured it, it worked enough for my medallion. I wasn't too worried about it. Um, but this goes into here, like so, if I have the right goes into here. Like was so. say, wasn't that on the bottom before? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so then I have this space to pour the plaster into. So I would let that pour and then harden up. So plaster takes about, you got to let it soak. Um, they call it slaking. So you mix plaster and we I won't love that word. There's something about that word. Just <laughs> it's just pleasant, isn't it? It's a cool word. <clears throat> so you pour your mound of plaster into your bucket of cold water and you let that water get absorbed by these, these plaster particles. And that's what's called slaking. And you let that sit for about five minutes. 
You don't stir it or anything. You just let it work its magic. <clears throat> and then you start mixing it for another several minutes. And then you can finally pour it in. And that gives it just the right consistency um, for pouring. It's like heavy cream. Uh, and it, it's not gonna harden too quickly, that it'll just crumble later. Like it's got some chemical integrity to it at that mixing level. And this was an art in and of itself, trying to learn how to mix plaster. <laughs> and and yeah. just taking little bits of knowledge. I've taken so many little online classes, read all the things I could find. And it's another one like no matter how much theory you ingest, until you actually practice it, uh, it takes a while to really know how to do it. But, um, so we have one piece of plaster, then that takes about half an hour to dry. It's a heat curing process. So kind of like silicone rubber, um, it, the more heat, it, it, it's a chemical process that creates heat as it cures. Um, and once it's done its thing, once it's cured, the temperature then goes down. So when you know if it's cool to the touch, uh, then you oh, know it's, it's ready. Nice. Mm -hmm. So then you can pour, or like, let's say this piece is now plaster. I can take out this rubber piece. Uh, you can, in my case, the reason I didn't clean the rubber is because I'm, it, it was not, it didn't have enough friction to um, be a problem when I separated the pieces. So it, it didn't have any undercuts that would make it cling in certain ways. But usually you would have your one piece of plaster, you would make the edge nice and clean, put in a key if you needed it, and then you put mold release on it, which is like a mold soap, um, right. because like rubber, plaster sticks to itself very, very well. So in this case, to, to skip those steps, I used the other side of the rubber. So we've got plaster in here, rubber. Then I would take out those. Then I would put the rubber in here and pour mm -hmm. the plaster in here. So now I've got two plaster pieces without having to go through the time of mold soaping, which saves you like an hour. I mean, it, nice. it's between all of the layers that you need and, and the sanding down of things and the making of perfect, <laughs> it, it just takes a while. So this is its base. Um, Cyclone has a base again for ease of, of coming apart. And then also I really wanted a nice flat smooth backing that I could scribble on those numbers. Yeah. So I went with a base for him. So the whole mold, as you see, is the base. And then um, my key on the side popped off and it still seems to be nice and sturdy and in place. So I didn't worry about making another one but it fits together like so. And then this, the pour spout, uh, is so I can get clay in there and out. And we're gonna peel one off right now. I kind of, actually, let's do this. I'm going to tilt the phone a little bit. And it's a very sticky phone. So this is my little tub of vinegar. And we are going to dip the plaster into vinegar. This is my mold release. So we're gonna take that mold that I just showed you. And we're going to apply our mold release. And it doesn't need to stay in there long, just a few seconds. Um, the other reason you want to do, if you're not doing vinegar, do water or something, because right now this plaster is so dry that it would kind of um, flash cure the clay uh. against it. But this is the important part I want the vinegar on. And you can see that plaster just sucked it right up. Right. I was going to say, hey, that's like my skin in winter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Colorado dry skin. So you can see it's liquid. Um, can you see? So I'll, I'll dig it again. I mean, look at how quickly oh, it yeah. sucks up the moisture. Slurp. Yeah. So that, we don't want it sucking the water from the clay that quickly. So now I'm going to put these pieces together. And I use rubber bands. The mold straps with the 
metal clamp can dig into the plaster. Like it, it's a little bit um, too harsh. So these rubber bands are great because they hold it in place nice and firmly, but they've got a little give. So like around the corners, they're not gonna crunch off. Where, is, where do you get rubber bands that size? Um, these, a lot of the molding stores have them. So like the smooth on place, any of the pottery places will have these. Uh, just, you could probably get them on Amazon too. Even the office stores might have them actually. So now I am going to get my clay slip. I have, this is the kind that I use. It is a cone nine porcelain, which is a nice high fire porcelain. And I'm just gonna shake it around. I used this a couple hours ago. Um, so it's, it doesn't need the mixer to go in like, but I've got a, a drill with a mixer bit. I don't know if Christina does it this any way anymore, but when she was, I was helping her with greenware, she would pour it. She had one of those big Tupperware. Yeah. Like pitchers. And that's how she would pour her greenware. These are small enough, like, cause these are just little one gallon buckets that I can get away without the pitcher. Um, but I really want the slip casting table with the hose. Like that was just awesome. So I'm going straight in. Nice. Pouring steadily. I would get that everywhere. <laughs> you learn to pour when you've got liquid resin. So come all the way up to the top. And then I'm going to leave the jug open. It's kind of in frame right here. The nice thing about the porcelain, now if this was earthenware, I would be letting this sit for a number of minutes. Um, but the porcelain is almost an in and out. Really? It, it, yeah, it just, this particular porcelain anyway, I don't know if it's all of them, but um, the, the mold sucks out the moisture from porcelain pretty easily. Mm. I mean, you can see how much it's going down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I am actually going to just now tip it over the bucket. Can you see that on camera? Yes. Cool. And everything I put in, besides what has now stuck to the walls, is going to go out. And I have to move this particular mold gets kind of angled. If you don't pour it out, does it just solidify in there or? It will take days to do so. <laughs> oh, gotcha. So first is something I can pour out in a couple of hours. And sorry, I'm going to block the camera here um, no to get to the other side. But let's see if I can get the stream so you can still kind of see that it's pouring out. But yeah, so you can absolutely do that. But to me, there's probably easier ways to get a, a more solid cast, like the press molding, um, which is where you take a, it's not slip, it's actual clay at that point, And you just squish it into the mold with your fingers. There we go. I was just more morbidly curious of what happens if you don't follow through fast enough. <laughs> yeah, so you get a really thick casting. And with these medallions, they're not thick enough to cause any problems, but you can only go so thick on your walls for firing before it becomes a huge risk. Like the thicker the walls, the more the liability because you get air trapped inside there and air expands in the heat. And that's how pieces shatter in the kiln during firing because they're trapped and they don't have anywhere to go. So they've right. got to break themselves out. So this is pretty good. I've got all my, not all of it, but just slow little drip. So we'll just leave that. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see in there, there's some yeah. light, there's yeah. a little shell and yeah. kind of see the thickness of the ledge of yep. the clay on the plaster. This porcelain is so, so strong. The thinner you cast it, the more translucent it will be. And it's, it's just amazingly strong. So you don't have to worry about it breaking. So now that I've got it here, I want it, here we are. I've got these little plastic cups that you saw in my, my cabinet. Um, right. I'm gonna put them on the top of this because I don't want it to dry from the inside out. 
I want it to be dry from the plaster. Got it. Sucking out the moisture. So I put the plastic cup on the top of it to help prevent some of that. Now I would set this aside and I'm going to put like an two hours on the time clock, but we get to light speed ahead. Julia Child has a chicken already cooked. That's right. <laughs> so this is one that's been sitting for about two and a half hours. Um, I like the two hour window for this mold. And I'm just going to lightly, I can't help myself. I don't need to do this, that but I like, I, I like to <laughs> scrape the stuff off the top. I don't know why, but you can kind of see how thick the clay is. Yeah. It's like an eighth of an inch. It's lovely. It's actually probably somewhere between a 16th and an eighth. So then I'm going to flip it over after I've taken my rubber bands off and I'm just going to shimmy this first little piece off and try to go straight up. I can feel it grabbing a little bit, but not bad. So that is the first half. Let me try to get out of the shadow here. <laughs> oh, that first looks so, that looks really clean. It is really clean. So there's a few little areas like where it stuck. Um, so there's like that one little crack right there. I don't know if you can see it here. Yep, I can see it. So yep. I'm going to put some slip in that. Uh, and sometimes it's easier to work off of when it's just right here. So let's see if I have this little bottle, squeezy bottle filled with slip. And sometimes the top, no, sounds like it's going to go up. Um, so sometimes the top is clogged, but this is just going to pour right out. And I'm going to use the tip of that to really get in there. Uh, maybe just a little bit right there too. Neat. So you can kind of see this piece wanted to pearl out. I probably have an undercut in the mold, um, but that's easily fixed with this guy. So stage two. And I'm vibrating a little bit. I can see that it's popped off more or less. And I can peel off. Neat. So this guy had two little pieces of the mold that had where the plaster had popped off. No big deal. I'm just going to uh, scrape those off when I go to clean him. But otherwise, he looks pretty good. Just a so few little areas. This is, this is greenware right now for everybody. This watching. is now greenware. This is very, very wet greenware. And let's see if I can move it so where the phone isn't in the shadow. Um, so you can see the, the moisture content. And then this is what a bone dried greenware looks like. Right. So you can see the moisture level in this clay still. And it has to be absolutely bone dry before it goes into the kiln because the moisture will also cause expansion and therefore explosion. No. So from here, if he's dry enough, you can already see that he wants to pop off from the side there. And then I'll just do a little twist. And oh, there he is. So nice. he's got a big crack right there that we're gonna fix while he's this wet. So when you're, when you're done and you've cl you clean them while they're still wet, correct? So actually I'm gonna get into that point for you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna set this guy aside. I've got little racks over here. So you're gonna hear my yeah, voice. I was gonna right ask on. about <laughs> if you racked them or something. So this guy, I wait for them to get bone dry before I actually start to clean them. And it's because they're, they're really soft mm -hmm. and pliable when they're still that wet. Um, and, and I tend to break them more. <laughs> you mush them. So I like to just wait till they're this dry. They're fragile, but I can still, as you see, handle them. And uh, let's see, this guy I've gotten, need to get the back on. So cleaning on greenware is very much different from cleaning on resins. 
You need water, a nice big brush. You can get a tool for scraping like that plaster nose off. I think I've already done it on this mold. Yeah, I've already done it on this mold. But if I needed to scrape it, uh, I use this guy and I just, so right. you can see kind of does this. Right. Um, but really water is gonna be your best friend. So I start with the back of these guys and you can see there's kind of some mold um, where I filled in with clay on the original piece uh, that leaves like a little bit of a line. So I'm gonna take a little tiny sponge, dip it in the water so it's, it's saturated and then I'm just gonna smooth out the clay. So you can see by the color how much yep. water I'm reintroducing but it dries pretty quickly because it's just a surface clean. It's not like I'm totally reinvigorating the body of clay with this water. So that's how I will go and make this totally flat and, and just nice and pretty. Um, sometimes like, you, I don't know if you can see it yet, but there'll be a little stroke where yep. the clay got grabbed too much because there's so much water going on. I will wait a few minutes until that is dry and then I'll take the brush and you'll see in a sec um, and then smooth it out with the brush. I think this is like one of those Chinese calligraphy brushes. Yep. But the size works really well because I've got that point, but I've got the side to work with as well. So I'm going to dip it in the water and just smooth out this curve so it's a little not quite as rough from where I broke it off the mold. And then I might smooth these pieces. And you can maybe see, um, there's some of those brush strokes, like where I grabbed, I don't know if the camera's picking that up yet. I think it's a little too white. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Um, but anyway, I'll just take the brush and smooth it. So then I'll flip over and you can see maybe, can you tell the seam right there? Can you see that on the camera? I, I, I see the detail, I don't necessarily see the seam. Okay, well there's a big giant seam. This will be disappointing if you can't see the seam. It goes up through here and then down his nose and then like into there. There but we go. What, what was a big giant seam, just take some water and now it's gone. So you can see where the two clay bodies meet. There's that different, um, in the seam, the, the clay bodies tend to stick a little bit more. So sometimes right. they can be a little darker, but as far as actual buildup, that seam is gone. And it's just by doing this little piece right here, you know, this little bit of water on the top of it it just softens the clay. It's kind of like how I use the solvent on my sculptures uh, to right. just soften and smooth the clay. You just get rid of that line. So I will go like everywhere, there's a jagged edge. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will just go ahead and smooth it down with the water and the flat of the brush if I need to, like this big area, I can use the flat of the brush. Uh, so it's not quite as jagged and you don't really sand, you can, but it's so much easier to do everything with this water technique first, to get everything smooth in this stage. Yeah. Like there's a, a ridge here that I want gone. So I'm just gonna- so You can actually see the ridge on the, uh, a little bit of ridginess on the actual round part of the sculpture. Where like here? it hits the back, yeah. Okay. So just taking the tip of my brush here, I have, cause I have the wording. So I have to be a little sure, careful. Sure. Um, and then just softening, making sure that that edge is nice and clean. So, but then it's gone and it was just a few strokes of the water. So then once you've done this entire piece, uh, you will let it, or I will let it sit for a little bit uh, just to make sure that there's no residual moisture. And in Colorado, we were nice and dry. So, I mean, that's like, right. 
And then I actually bisque fire these guys. Um, so this is soft bisque fires. So with porcelain, you have the added advantage. Earthenware fires at a much lower temperature. Like its maturity fire is uh, like a cone four or six. Uh -huh. And it's kind of like negative numbers. Think of the zero in front of a number as a negative sign. If it's got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the higher the number, the hotter the fire. Right. Um, if it's got zero, zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, you're actually, it's, it's cooling. Like the, if uh, zero, 20 is a cooler fire temperature than a zero far. Four, rather. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So once you hit that, I don't know why the organ cone kind of, um, there's test cones, so you can make sure your kiln is firing at the temperature it says it's firing at. They kind of ruled school with those, those cone right. temperatures. I think they were the originators of that, that function. Um, but this is a soft bisque fire. So this is fired to cone four which is what would mature earthenware, but because this is a cone nine clay body, this is just, you, you haven't really fully gotten the full chemical um, benefit from the structure. The What's fire. the advantage of that? This is still soft enough to sand. Mm. So things that I have missed, like let's say that this was still pretty rough, I can take my sandpaper, and sand it down. So this gives a nice little buff to the finish of this nice. before I hard fire it. Because once I fire it to maturity, um, you heard in the beginning of the episode how I almost started some fires because <laughs> <laughs> like literally my little grinding wheel is black <laughs> and had flame coming out of it. So the, the cone nine porcelain is so strong that it cannot be sanded. Um, I even tried diamond, diamond bits on it and it can be, but you really have to cool it down right away. Right. It's, it's like cutting porcelain like, tile. Like you said, saw. like that, that's why tile guys have water saws. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I like having the stage. I could skip it. I could go straight to maturity right. fire, but I really like having the hardness to work on. Like I'm probably not gonna break this guy. Right. And I can really make sure that he is cleaned to perfection. Um, now he is a hand-built piece and I've got a hundred of them to do. Plus <laughs> places. So my eye is going to miss some of that. So you have the, the human imperfection side of that. But I think that's part of the charm is that no piece sure. is going to be completely like the other. Like they're all hand built and that geeks me out too. So I hope that the people buying these will appreciate that side of it too. Like this is not a factory machined piece. This is built by hand laboriously. <laughs> right, clearly. And Question then though, even though after you hard fire them because they're porcelain, people that can glaze can still glaze them, correct? They technically could. Um, they will get blacklisted. From, <laughs> they, I mean, really that's, that's what it boils down to. These, this addition of a hundred is meant to stay as it, yeah. and it will be very clearly stated that way as well. Like you will not end up in anybody's good graces if you alter this piece, like no alterations allowed. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the only way. And the hobby is honestly really good about that for the most part. Yeah, if they know, they're usually fairly respectful. I, I, they really yeah, are. The other upside you have is there's so few people that could do that. Yes. It's not likely it's going <laughs> to happen, right? Right. Like, like, I mean, I can't, I can't even think of anybody that Leslie, of course, and Karen Gerhardt would never do that. Marge Parker well, and the nice thing that. And is everybody the else is retired. The glazers will have access through me to bisque people. Like if you are an unknown glazer Pristina, and I know who you are, <laughs> right. like you said, there's like five of them. <laughs> they can, they can reach out to me. Um, and that was part of my custom glaze agreement was that I could let go of it, basically think of it as a guest artist piece. Right. I was going to say that you can guest out pieces to people. Yes. Um, so yeah, they can, because we are such a small community. And most of us, 
really just enjoy the glazing and we enjoy glazing on a great piece. So it's still a small enough market that we like to share those pieces with each other. So it'd be interesting to see, I really love it when they're guest artists on Peace Life. So you can see that not only the different colors that you're gonna get with a custom glaze, but all the different styles. Yes. That, that's what I really like about pieces that, you know, have a very limited kind of custom glaze run. Like when they did those with the autos yep. um, for, for Joni or the Marcher Wear Horses, where it was this, you know, the same sculpture and there was like three artists that custom glazed them. And it's they were just fun. Different, yeah. You, you, it's a nice way to get variety into a piece without like really changing it. Because like you said, it's, it's just another artist's voice, their style right. input into it. And it, you can do the, I think we had this conversation you guys did on one of your Mares and Black episodes about like the Hamilton on how there was four, three or four different people that did the same paint job. And oh, they, yeah. looked, they yeah. all looked different because of the different styles. And that's exciting. Yeah, it was the, it was the, uh, the, the finish work contest for best custom and like three people, it was the same horse. It was the same reference. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, it, and they were all fabulous. And it was just, Oh, they were great. How different they were. I mean, it, it, that's just the beauty of it, of, of art. When you get your own style, when you're not copying somebody else's that becomes boring. But when you find out like your own way to interpret things, and then people get to see that side of you, you know, to see that in your art and say, oh, I recognize that is so-and-so's piece. That's exciting. So I get, I, I'm geeked out by that. <laughs> <laughs> it, okay. It's just, yeah. One of the things I used to pride myself on is I wouldn't even have to know an artist, you know, it's, it's, it's still for the major players. There's a lot more artists now though, I think, but I yeah. used to people be like, that's a la 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 piece. And that's a do 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 piece. And so-and-so did this because of the hallmarks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way their eye took in things and, and what they like to do stylistically. It's just neat to see all those different interpretations. And, and it's, that's kind of what makes life exciting too, is that we all see things so differently, even if it's the yeah. same thing. So, so that was amazing. Thank you so much for taking us. You're very welcome. Process. Thank you for... for Dragging through that with me. <laughs> right. Well, he, but to me, China, especially production, is the most intimidating discipline there is in the hobby. Do you know oh, what I mean? Great. So for, for you to humanize it a little more for people, like it's harder than casting medallion. Of course, you have to have the slip and all that kind of stuff. But but for people to kind of see the process, I'm sure will inspire some people yeah. to, to try it, which is I great. I hope so. Because really I, I know a dearth of, of of China artists in the hobby right now, because, you know, Joan retired, Lynn retired, Addie went on to, to do her Different icon, things. you know, religious yep. art. Um, Leslie, while wonderful, is not terribly prolific. You know, Christina is doing HR Tennessee and that's her passion now, which yep. like she's still doing China, but it's OF China. It's, you know, resurrecting HR molds. So, and you, and Karen. And, and yeah, Karen also so is- people. Karen travels so much, you know, she's not, she's not prolific either. Well, and that's the thing is the, the few of us of the few of us that are actually glazing still, we're so few and far between because it's not our, our main gig. Right. Like I've got the day job plus the resins, plus the painting. Plus the horse. <laughs> For those are just, Jen has a full-time job. So like, and, beyond and, and, all and, this, like, so um, yeah, so and yeah. husband, and <laughs> and is it three or two dogs? Two, two but dogs, being... four horses, four horses. Girl, <laughs> you know, you manage your time, you can fit all of it in. That I do not agree with the whole thing about you have to limit yourself or give up something in order to do something else. I don't like giving up anything. I want it all. <laughs> so I find ways to make it happen. Right, right. How and, much and that's, how, how much that's do you me sleep? Though. Six hours tops? No, no, no. I get like at least eight hours. Two. Sleep is also very important to me. <laughs> no, I have, because my day job is at the house, um, I can 
usually do casting while I'm doing the day job as well. Right. So there's some multitasking that I can do. Um, I might do maybe priming before the day job or at the lunch break. So that can be drying while I'm doing something else. Right. There's, there's ways to mix things. <laughs> you do that. Like I do laundry when I'm working from home. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to throw away the laundry. <laughs> That's right. Use the laundry, fold the laundry, go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> but you have those minutes of downtime in each right. side. So maximize them, you know, fill your day. So, so, so how do you, how do you feel being regarded as one of, you know, the A-list, the, the B and A's big name artists, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, you've been there for a while and, and you know, I, I was talking the other day to somebody and I said, you know, the list is not, you don't get there in park, right? The list is no. always changing. And if you, if you look back to who was A-list even five years ago, it's a very different a set of names like they're still like sarah sarah's you know just you know oh, legend legend level right amazing. But, but like what how do you feel about being classified at that level how you've been there for a while how do you stay present stay relevant stay on trend if you will yeah you know i think the thing that got you to the top which is this this need to always learn, to always improve um, is what will keep you there as well because you're never stagnant. There's always a way to, to either up your, your ante and your artwork somehow, um, whether that's like drawing in a new medium, like if you've been resin and now you're gonna do China as well, um, or if you are just gonna improve your quality of your finish work if you're a finish work artist or add even more detail if you're a sculpture artist there's so many different ways to improve your work if you stay stagnant the hobby will move past you yes um, yes so i've seen it happen and people get very bitter about it and they do uh, they just think that they you can't just get there and stop like it's no. not and and that's true for any field no matter what you are because you know time is always moving forward so you have to move forward with it. And that comes from the learning, the self-improvement. Um, so in order to self-improve, you have to be willing to take advice. Um, if you are stuck somewhere, ask a friend to give you a friendly critique or whatnot. Uh, I think that is the best way to move forward. It's not the only way. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is the best way. And frankly, the easiest, because it gives you the quickest path to see what you were doing wrong. Um, if you are very, very good already about seeing holes in your, your body of work, you can move past that and, and continue to grow. Mm -hmm. There are certain people, and, and the more skill you get, the more you can see those holes. Um, it just takes you so much longer. So get a right. really good group and and have them give you feedback and don't be afraid of that you cannot take everything personally yeah like, I, used to, I, used to, to me. Go ahead. I used to love the china the china uh artists with all the american you know this i don't think they've had one of these gatherings in five or six years but joan and leslie and karen gerhardt and Lynn I, it would get together and do like, you know, mud hinge, mud, the mud hinge thing and all get to share techniques and work on projects together and stuff like that. It's huge. And, and the nice thing about that too, like in I, ideal world, if I ever get the house, like I, I'm a remodel crazy person. I can't leave. She's anything. also doing her bathroom people. I mean, yeah, the bathroom is mostly finished, <laughs> <laughs> but I moved on to the basement lounge area now. So. <laughs> but, um, if you can get together with people and you feed off that, that energy and that learning, you can learn something from one person on how they do it and then take something from that and make it yours. So you're not doing it the same way they did it. And it just continues to grow and expand. I, and that's exciting too. It's again, how your eye sees, um, how you put your voice on the piece and People think that by sharing a technique, that means they're giving away their secrets. And it's like, no, 
it, it just means you've gotten information out there and somebody might see that and read it a certain way that appeals to them. And so they do it that certain way, which is different from what it right. originally started out. And that's, I think that's a really good point because I think, and I'm, I know you experienced this when you were starting, is that people sat on their techniques in this hobby like smog yep. on his dragon horde and wouldn't yep. share because for some reason the logic was if you give away your techniques then you're going to be surpassed or you're you're not going to be as uh, your stuff will look like their stuff and then they're not as important as they were and I think that that's something that has changed so much with the younger generation is very open and into sharing and which I think is fantastic because you know yeah. till Carol came along with her book right it's like it getting was water just, out of a rock yeah you could not get information I mean just so much of my the stuff that I learned was with Carol in her book and then trial and error. And then it was still a lot of pen pal stuff back then and the few little internet buddies that came across. Um, and, and it was wonderful that time of sharing that we had, just that small group. So with the social media, the way it is, it's so easy to share things. Right. And I really appreciate that it is. Now, having said that, I do want people to understand that an artist is not obligated to share with you. Sure, sure. So there are people that I think like I, I get some roots bees on my page that are just like, well, how did you do that? They don't even say please. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's not that I want to be elitist or not share with you, but I mean, if you're rude, I'm not going to share anything because <laughs> Also, like the, the how do you boil the ocean questions, right? Like, like no. Yeah. Like, how, do you, how do you make an artist present? Well, yeah, you got to narrow it down to a practical question that leads me to believe that you have tried to get there and are stuck because you right. have asked the proper question. Um, and I, I really want to help all of those people. I also do not give like a list of how to do it from A to B. Right. Because I think that does not help you. I think you need to do the trial and error to see mm -hmm. how to get to A to B. And, and that practical application, again, which I'm, you just need to practice. And that's how you're going to learn the most by finding out what worked and what didn't for you. Right. So, and, and things that work for me might not work for you. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I really think it's nice to give hints and clues and, and little pieces of information, but I do purposely hold back the whole picture because it does not do any benefit for the person trying to learn. Right. Handholding is, you know, in any situation is, doesn't empower whoever's trying to learn it craft or process or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't because nothing can be given to you. It, you have to do the work and the work is long and arduous and you have to be resilient. Um, you have to expect, I don't even like the word failure. You, you just have to, every failure is one movement forward. Right. Because it, people look at failure as a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. You get to check that box off as something that didn't work. So you're not going to waste your time on it again, or it might have worked in a different way. So now you have this application to use later on in a different process. Right. But you never would have found it had you not tried the work. Yep. So totally it, agree. It, the I, instant gratification just does not work. Yeah, and I and I think um, I think people get so discouraged that their first time or their second or third time, it doesn't look great. And it's not going to look great. And it's not even, even more, I've seen like mid range artists that are getting there, but aren't there yet. The, That's the, tough. The ugly stage in the middle is yes. still something they, they have a hard time coping with. So that, that is a hard time for every artist. Like we all get there. There is that moment of you're, you're on the cusp you think you're pretty good and you are getting good, but you're not quite there yet. And so you've got this, like, I'm still not there, but I've plateaued here, push through it. It's, right. it's just around the corner. You can't see it, but it's right there. You got to have 
And actually, that's what separates the people who mm. actually go on to the top and the people who don't. The people who are brave enough to keep pushing and work through that doubt to, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Right. It, it's there. Just I, just, lo- I love it when I see an artist that I've been following turn that corner because mm-hmm. you can see it, right? And, you know, I'm yep. not a model horse artist. Don't get me wrong, but I am an artist artist. And, you know, I think I have a pretty good eye, a pretty good collection. And watching them go from, oh my God, you can see glimmers of yes. genius, but it's not quite the, like it's the whites aren't quite white. The expression's not quite right. There's, you know, they need to get their finesse down. And then they produce that next round of pieces. If they keep going, you're like, there it is. There it is. Like, that's amazing. Like, yeah, but, but they can't get defeated and they can't get so like there's, there's two pitfalls to that. There's the people that are just like, Oh, I'm never going to get there. I'm so close. And I still haven't made it happen. I give up. And then there's the other people who are just like, they have the opposite mentality. They know they've gotten good. They are blind to the fact that they're not quite over that, that cusp yet. Mm -hmm. And they become very resistant to To critique, to critique. And that's sad too, because there's so much potential if they just knock the ego out of the way. Yep. So yep. I've seen that as well. And, and I made this mistake for a long time uh, that, uh, that people wanted that feedback from somebody like me because I did collect A-list stuff. And, and sometimes it would be fine. And sometimes they would be completely offended. And I was like, not doing that anymore. You know? And, you know, that's the problem is those kind of people who want the critique they just want the attention they don't want the actual critique all they want you to do is tell them their pieces are great you're not going to learn from that um and it's a waste of time and it actually yeah. really puts people on guard like yeah. there's a lot of of artists and collectors who are great like they have amazing eyes and they can pick out stuff so easily but they won't do it even when asked by an unknown, you know, because they're so guarded because they've been burned before. No. And people take it very personally. And, and I mean, I think I said something about, I haven't, I haven't offered free advice in years pretty much, but uh, there was somebody that was doing a sport horse sculpture and uh, I can't even remember, but I was like, just an observation I had. And they were like, no, this is this. They literally said, no, this is perfect. I love it. And that's Okay. (laughs) major or anything but I think it would have this just the observation would have just pushed it over the edge a little more as far as authenticity goes and you know they don't want the critique fine but I was that's the thing yeah that sucks that's the thing about critiques too you can get input but then it's still up for you to decide to use that or how to use you know, and it's like, funny too, that's another re- thing I've seen. I've seen people go get critiques. I like where, not for me, obviously, for like full, you know, anatomical Morgan style critiques. You know what I mean? But Right. And then the horse comes out of whatever critique, not Morgan's, it's just an example. And the horse is worse. And I'm like, did they take all the advice? <laughs> like, did they yeah, not you know what they were supposed to change? Don't take critiques blindly. Because um, a lot of the times what people are seeing might not be the actual place that the the real change needs to happen like they might see a small head but where it really is is the head is fine the neck is too long right you know right. something like that but but i really think you still have to be true to you as an artist you have to know what you want out of that sculpture and if you get a critique that goes against that then you have to either know how to incorporate it so where it works with your piece or choose not to use that critique right Right. Like just well, because you or cherry pick it for things that'll. Yeah. Just because you get information doesn't mean you have to use it. Yeah. So what are some of the favorite pieces? Speaking of critique, what are your favorite pieces that you've done? Like, I know oh, a lot of them have flown out into the world. I know you've kept a few, but like. You know, I really don't keep a lot of horses. Like I, I love finishing pieces, like just the work that gets into them, but I don't need to keep them. Like, my joy is in the creation and then I want somebody else to have the joy in the <laughs> to give you money and, and go, <laughs> that's right go because like I have real horses and they burn money <laughs> <laughs> I'm four of them now <laughs> but um 
you know, Cover Girl is still my all time favorite. I look at that sculpture and I'm still just like, I cannot believe I sculpted that. Like she's still astounding to me. Um, As far as finish work goes, they were all pieces that I tried a a different technique and it gave me an, an impactful result. Not necessarily a good one, but you know, and the two that I'm going to list did, but it was the after. I know what one's going to be. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so the flu bit and anise. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just because it was such a different way to do that technique. And I did like the texture that I got from it. Um, it was an impressive piece as an art form. Oh, yeah. So that was one of my favorites. Um, and then the first David I did, he was a chestnut overo. Bl- no, chestnut homos, I guess, Tobiano. And he was one of the horses that put me like firmly into the spot of artist that knows what she's doing. We okay. should look at this person. Right. Um, I had struggled with the dapples. And at that point I had reached a technique that I really liked the dapples on. And it was working with thin dry brush layers of oils over top of my usual technique. So. It was just those two I'm going to point out because they ended up being amazing pieces, but I like them more for the jump that they gave me in right. my team. But Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to think of other pieces, but the reason I like them is not because they were just like an amazing piece right. um, or they came I- out so wonderful, but it was, it was something that they did for me. I so Maggie and you showed this in CEO before that went done in that really dark Vrolia. I mm-hmm. mean, with not a stitch of white on that thing, and it's just so deep and beautiful. It's so pretty. That so one has a pretty. Lot of fire. Yeah, he had a boo boo that I had to touch up with white. O- the the white. <laughs> so he's got a lot of fires on him. <laughs> but, uh, but but see, that's an example of how a mistake made a piece even better. Because, you know, something that would have been five fires and pretty nice, I had to really work and, and redo and take my time bringing up. And it just, it came out so deep, like you're saying. Like, there's yeah, so just, many flares of translucent glaze on him. Just, he, he's so cool. He's so pretty. The chestnut, too, just like, mm-hmm. gorgeous. It, it, there's just something about a glossy horse, too. Like, the, the china underneath with the gloss glaze and the richness of colors. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it's, it was a moth to a flame for me. I love that. I, I know but, I, I mean, only for a long gloss. time, that's why I was so much more into earthenware because earthenware was, it was produced at a way higher rate of glossies. I love the glossy. Yeah, there, there's just, I know I need to incorporate more satin, but I kind of feel like the resin world is the satin horse. So- well, and HA does the satins, you know? Yeah. HA does a ton of satins. Yeah, it, it, it's, I like the glossies a lot. Like yeah. they just, ugh, it, they bring out colors so well. Yeah. It, it's like when the world is raining and wet and all the trees, like you can see the brown of the bark and the green of the needles yeah. um, or leaves if you're somewhere lush, you know, it brings out those colors more. It's the same thing with the gloss. Right. So it, that's what appeals to me. So we've seen what you're doing for the near future, right? We've seen what you're producing for Briarfest with the, re- the awesome reveal. Mm-hmm. What? And there are like, still some, some surprises left. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> what's, what's out there for you long-term goal-wise? I would like to start doing more chimes um, because- Oh, so would it's we. A, <laughs> yeah. It, well, that's the thing. It is a wide open market. Like there oh, are yes. so few people that do it. I like it because I don't have to compete with my customer. Like, so I'll make the sculptures and I'll sell the unpainted resins. Well, if I paint stuff for Briarfest on my pieces, I'm now competing with my customers who have painted their resins and are trying to sell them. Mm -hmm. Um, So I like the idea of going into the China because I I don't compete that way. Um, It's a completely different market. So I want to get more of the Chinas. I want to, um, now that I am kind of knowing what I'm doing with this porcelain stuff, 
I feel better. Like I've, I've gotten the plaster mixing down finally. And this has been like a 10 year progress. And I oh, still wow. think that I'm just in like the journeyman stage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we've gotten past apprentice. We're into the journeyman. We are nowhere near master just yet, but it's a hard medium. I mean, oh my gosh, it is. You do have to be resilient to, to play with this medium because there are so many failures. And even when you are a master, the clay has a mind of its own and it still might decide to do its own thing (laughs) but I have molds um in progress that I'd like to get out there so David is in porcelain or will be I have his his plaster molds I need to make the rubber block and case molds so like the nice thing about the rubber molds is that when you break a plaster piece or it wears out you can just cast another without having to go the whole clay up thing um, and spend days and days and days working on stuff. Uh, so you just take your plaster, pour it in the rock mold, and then off you go. Right. You do have to let plaster dry for a little while after it's first been made, um, just to complete the curing process. Right. Uh, but I have the molds of di- uh, David. I have a Levi denim mold that he needs a little tweak. He's got two pieces where it pulls, like I can't get him out of the mold. So I've got to redo those. And I want to do cover girl in China because she's so balanced on that peg that she's got enough support that she would be a very good candidate for China, I believe, especially with the strength of porcelain. So that is exciting to me. Um, With the sculpture, I've moved him over there, but the clay piece that I'm working on, I want to do some more digital sculpting because I have a digital scanner. So I want to scan him in and then like redo the tail. So he's got a braided tail and then scan that portion in again and discover ways that we can maybe swap them on the same piece, you know, like the magnetic stuff, if that works to my, my liking. Otherwise it's two versions that I get with one piece. Um, I want to try doing more details digitally because I, I like how fine you can sculpt in the computer. Yes. So you might see- The braided some- tail is a great candidate for that because one of my pet peeves is not so much the braided manes, but the braided tails because they're yes. always too thick and the fidelity thick. is not quite great. Yeah. And, and you've got the armature wire in there that you know is a pain in the butt. So, and, and it's hard to sculpt braids. Like you can sculpt them, but it, it just, the tools have to be tiny enough whereas digitally it's very easy. So like you just build up a little bit of clay. And and I think, again, it's why limit yourself. It's take the best of the both mediums. In this case, one's digital, one's clay Mm -hmm. and work them. You know, you don't have to limit yourself to one or the other. Combine them and and see that's, to me, this is the next level of my sculpture. Like this is how I grow uh, is, is seeing what further details I can get. Yeah, and, kind of a hybridized approach to, to yeah. sculpting. Like I, I love the feel of the clay on my fingers too much. And I'm so quick at it now that it doesn't make sense to me to go fully into the computer yet. Um, but I like the idea of the com- the combination. Right. So. I think Ky- and Kylie, I think, said the same thing when she was doing her Briar West meet and greet that, you know, digital sculpting is fine. But for her, it's the tactile experience. Yeah. Right. It's the, it's the kind of workman nature of it yes. that, that is therapeutic. Like, and I'm a computer gal. I mean, graphic designer, I'm on the computer all the time. I enjoy being on the computer. So it, it, it is just something though about getting away from the electronic, the computer screen and mm-hmm. shoving clay around. <laughs> it just, it's really, it is therapeutic, I think. Um, just to unplug but I like the idea of the combination. So that'll be fun. Um, I think that's a really, that's an interesting way to approach it. I would have never thought of that. Like playing out 80, 85% and then going in there and doing really high fidelity detail work with the the brush or whatever. Yeah. And and it, again, that's my love of efficiency. If it takes me so long to do these little things in clay, but it takes me two minutes to do them on the computer. Why wouldn't I just do them on the computer? I so, think, I mean, I think, um, and it's getting more popular. I think the 3D sculpting and printing is, is really daunting to a lot of people that do things traditionally. It's hard to see. 
like because you're you have a 3d object on a 2d screen mm -hmm. so it's it's hard to get your eye to wrap around that perspective well, I think, um, and I also think it's just the technology itself. Like 3D is yeah. an intimidating, like even me, I do a ton of 2D stuff and I can dip into 3D, but 3D is a whole nother bucket of wax, right? And the programs are massive. I yes. mean, just like I'm taking a learning course on ZBrush and we're like 20 hours in and all we've discussed is the number of brushes. That <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> So it's like, holy crap, you know, it's awesome that the program's that powerful, but I mean, the learning curve is steep. Absolutely. So, but it's fun. Again, I like challenges. I like learning and it's more rewarding when you do crest that hill. Right. Um, so, so that's, I think the motivating factor for me is I always set myself little challenges and they don't have to be big ones. There are big ones but you have to have the little humps along the way that right. you can get yourself over. Cause if you only set the big ones, you you're going to overwhelm yourself. Right. Like you you've set it so far that you're like, I can't do that. But if you set yourself little goals, then you're like, okay, I got that one. I got that one. And then you look back behind you and there's this huge trail that you've already come through. So it, it's kind of cool, but um, yeah. So China's lots and lots of China's. Um, <laughs> And I, I really want to expand that market. If we ever, you know, sell the family business or, you know, like dad retires, dad's the brains of that business. And it, it's um, not my forte. So it would probably be very valuable to sell. And then I would really build up the models. Oh, you uh, would go full time. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. I would go full time. I would hire people. Like we'd have, we'd be casting in house. I'd have resin cleaners. We'd be doing the micros in house that have micro cleaners. We'd be doing the Chinas in house, you know, and I would have all of these little worker bees per se. They're so important because then it would leave me to do the job that my skill set is made for. Right. So, but it, it's hard to find good people. Um, right now, I don't have the time for that. I don't have the facilities for that. I don't have the emotional energy for that. Right, right. <laughs> But if in the future, like that's, that's the big grand plans. And, and I always have plans. I always have schemes. My husband's eyes glaze over <laughs> as I sit there and I tell him my new scheme for the day, you know, <laughs> but I like planning. I like dreaming. I think you should, I think you should absolutely have these little places that you want to go to and these hopes that you want to achieve. So Awesome advice, especially the little, you know, don't try and eat the whole elephant, like just focus, focus like on a leg or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for sculptures, that's actually exactly what I did while learning on a piece, because it's too overwhelming to say, I'm going to make the best piece I possibly can. It, it just doesn't work that way. I would say, okay, I'm struggling with legs. This sculpture is going to be all about legs. And then would move on from there. Like, right. okay, now I'm struggling on ears. This sculpture is going to be all about ears and put these little pieces in because once you learn that lesson, it's pretty much in there for me. So once I had legs and then I had ears and then I had, you know, the chest and then I had the butt and I could put it all into one piece now because it took me all of these other sculptures to right. get to there. Right. So it's again going back to that it's not going to all happen at one time at the very beginning you have to get all these little puzzle pieces so you can form the complete puzzle sure but, do you have any other thoughts um i don't think so i've pretty much run my mouth <laughs> off <laughs> pretty well <laughs> and we appreciate it like i totally did not expect a whole little mini clinic wrapped up in a reveal it's been amazing oh, no. we'll probably We'll probably end up, speaking of eating the elephant, we'll probably make a part one and part two. I was this. thinking that too. <laughs> they're listening to me. I'm like, this is going on long. Um, I can't help myself. I, I'm actually a very quiet person. I'm not a great social person either. So that helps because I just make art. Um, but I really, you, you mentioned about how I feel getting to the top. And I think that that is kind of one of my responsibilities 
of being at the top is I had so much help getting there, you know, with, with mm-hmm. friendship and, and critiques and eyes and support and shout outs. Like you were a big person in my early career too, that gave me so much support. And I remember all that. And I think it's our job to go full circle with it and give it back and, and raise up the new stars. And, and it's just, it makes for a more caring environment and a happy environment and a community. And I really, that's so open up, (laughs) you know, like don't, don't close yourself off and, and just make friends because they're invaluable in this hobby. Um, Open up to suggestions and new things. It's just, it's a wonderful world. Don't close yourself off to it. Oh, you know what we didn't do? Show me your little sniffy warm blood that you're sculpting the, 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 the one on the armature okay i just want i'm like i think that's the only one that it could be he's right over here so we are at oh i love him her yeah, and hopefully it's him oh. go. hopefully um the phone isn't warping him too much mm-hmm. but you can see he's so chill He's just relaxed. Like his tail has a nice loose swish. He's not tense in any way. Um, I love his it. His head is low. I can this see him out in a, in a pasture kind of sniffing yeah. as he comes up to the barn or whatever. Well, and I showed you his um, his, uh, his inspiration photo. Yeah. And it wasn't a gelding that was kind of nosing through the grass. You know, maybe he saw something else there, so he wasn't quite ready to stop and pluck that piece. I love um, it. So from a performance point of view, it reminds me of going on a long rain after you've had a a really intense lesson or something like that. So yeah, this is my gelding. When we when we do our dressage lesson and we are really working and he's up in the back and he's using those muscles and he's got his butt underneath him and he's shoving off with that hind leg. And then I just let him have a stretch and let him go and he's like. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> you know, that's, he can be any number of things, but so I got to redo or not redo. I got to do his chest. Yeah. It's not quite finished. Um, and the groin I'm going to do in ZBrush as well, but I'm really excited because I want to get in and do like a whole bunch of veining and he's going to have a couple of versions. So I have them written down somewhere. Um, I'm going to do a loose tail like this with the bang then I'm going to do a braided tail and I am going to do hunter braids on one and then I'm going to do the regular braids and then I'm going to do the loose mane and then one of those versions and I can't remember which one um I want to do a couple of painted pieces but I want to do like the checkerboards and the shark fins yeah 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 because I think oh and I want to do a um clip pattern in sculpture because I think that would be fun. I love clip patterns, and they're and you know, there's they're not really utilized very often. No, Dari Dari Joan Frank customized a couple of briars, I think it was, um, to do to, with uh, winter coat clip patterns, right? Mm-hmm. And one of them was silver dapple, and so that the the grown out coat was astonishingly a different color than the clip uh-huh. that far. And it was just such a great idea. And I already, I love performance clips. So. Oh, they're you know. great. And, and that was one of the things that inspired that was that, you know, for the first time, um, my mare was in full work and she grew her little woolly mammoth coat and she was sweating. So I'm sure. Bad. So we did the trace clip on her and I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, we clip every year all these sport horses that I'm, I'm riding with and the barns are coming in for clinics and stuff all have clips for the same reason. This is such a thing. Why don't we do it on models more often? I think a lot of the references that people see though are Grand Prix level, whether it be, you know, Hunter or Hunter or Jumper, or, you know, the, the, the a- hunter that area. and nine times out of 10 in the winter, they're in Florida and they're clipped all the way. <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, that yeah. was purple because he was clipped within an inch of his life, head to toe. And people were like, that's a weird color. And I'm like, he's clipped. And it's skin. <laughs> he's purple because he's clipped. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. But no, in, in Colorado, we see the extreme fuzzy with the very quick. Right. Ain't, ain't nobody got time for that, right? Yeah. They, they're just going to have their, you know, their saddle clip or their half blanket clip or, you know, and keep leave the fur on the legs and the back, you know. And that's what I actually ended up doing. So I did the, the trace clip on Ivy earlier because she was so fuzzy so quickly. And then I ended up doing this um, February, uh, the full body clip, except leaving the legs because she was just like still poofing, still sweaty. And I'm like, all right, off it all goes. But it, <laughs> again, that is just, it's another example of being out in the real horses mm -hmm. and being able to have that inspiration and translate it into the models. So I'm definitely going to add a clipping path to this guy because he is a warm blood. He is a sport horse. Um, he's not going to be so based in Florida or California. So he's going to have some fur. <laughs> Are, so for the loose mane, are you doing pulled? Yeah. Yeah. It'll still be, it'll still, everything will be geared towards a performance horse. He might just not be performing at that level in time, you know, sure, but sure. in the sculpture, he's out in this field or in the relaxed training ring, you know, they've been in the lesson or something. Uh, so I like the, again, the idea of telling the same story like he's a warm blood, you know, so he's probably, he's a fit warm blood, he's young, but if he's got all like the banged tail, then it makes sense to make the pulled mane. Right. You know, it's, it's that whole visual, the, all the little components that go into the story that you are trying to tell. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. I'm excited. I, about I know you're all excited for him. <laughs> Like that is my jam. Like Annis, I love Annis. It's also a, but more of a thoroughbred type sport yeah, horse. She's but still, you know, I, I, and she's, you know, because she's an eventing horse, she's, she's weedier than your standard one, you know, because she's 0% body fat, basically. <laughs> but, but, but there's less. <laughs> what I love about warm bloods is they're just so, they're just, even when they're not performing, they're just so round. Mm -hmm. and and graphically and, pleasing, like, you know? and they have those beautiful long arch necks and and even when they're just like i'm going to sniff this poo on the ground they're just the most beautiful thing i've ever seen you know what i mean <laughs> they're, they're the sports cars it, I mean, it, yeah when, and when they're in shape even when they're turned out you can just see how magnificently their condition yes. is i just love them yeah and that's this guy is young he's going to be a budding warm blood so he's not he going to have that like he captures that essence of fitness like his top and line is not and, quite there right but they half the time they're born with that you know what i mean like yes, they're well they bred are, they, are they bred just out so with well. that beautiful arched neck so it's like what the hell yeah <laughs> but but there are subtle differences and and that's that's cool to see like again real horse knowledge mm going into the model, I know what not to put in and what to put in to get the story that I want. So yeah, he's, he's going to have like an underdeveloped, um, loin area because he, he hasn't had the years of work in the canter to really develop that. Um, the thin kind of withery area of the shoulder, you know, like all the top line areas, but he'll right. have the underlying warm blood curve that you're talking about. Right. The, the scope even when they're not jumping right <laughs> <laughs> have you have you come up with a name for him yet um there's a horse in the barn whose name i actually I, I just love he is ari for short but it's arcturus and Neat. it's off of a star and um i want to i want to name him that so. i so i don't know why i think this and this is just a funny aside but the most warm bloody name I've ever heard in my life for some reason is Cougarand, Cougarand. And it's like, I think a Cougarand is a South, uh, South African unit of money or something. But I used to, I've seen several um, people name their, their warm bloods to that. And like, to me, that's the epitome warm blood name. Like, oh, this is my horse Cougarand. Like, you know, $250,000 warm blood. <laughs> Stand yeah. there looking at you like so. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm so bad with names. 
Um, it, I usually don't even have a name until we're at the way end and I have to come up with something for marketing. So. <laughs> but there, I know that there are people that start with a name and, and I can't do that. It inspires them or something. You know, that's another technique thing. Like they need their name yeah. to, to, so they can refer to them and give them a, a, a backstory or whatever. Right. It gives them a picture in their yeah. head. Whereas I've got a literal picture in front of me. <laughs> Whatever your name is, you look good. All right. We have talked for two and a half, more than two and a half hours. <laughs> I was going to say, have we hit the three hour mark? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I mean, I, I know you and me, you talk about not being social, but like we clicked the first time we met and was just like we just, chatty yeah. freaking Kathy. So yeah. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing all with this with us because it's oh, just this was a, so much fun. such a treat. I appreciate it so much. Um, I love the reveal. It's going to be such a smash hit. I can't wait to get one. Yeah, I, I just love, I love the creating. It's, it's what drives me in the end. I just have to, the fact that we can take nothing and make something it is astounding. It yeah. is mind-boggling astounding. So that drives me because I, I mean, I, we do it all the time and yep. anyway, so yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that I can get all these pieces out there and I'm so thankful for the customers that continue to finance that for me. <laughs> right. right. We, we all like paying for your vision. So well, this was fun and I'm glad I could I could give you a little bit more of the inside view of that. No, it's fantastic. I mean, this is I a love sharing master class, seriously. So. Well, and that is something that I do want to do um, is I was inspired when I was looking for um, plaster information, like mixing and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there was a pottery guy that had a plaster class online and I was like, you know, we don't have any online classes like and I, and I do make paid for I'm full professionally produced classes like where it, it is very structured and here's right. the first phase here's the second phase that you can work down in a time frame and I want to do molding I want to do slip casting I want to do how you fire porcelain you know, all of these things that go on a, a video platform somewhere. Yeah, I think, I mean, we always had Lynn doing the live clinics and now Heather Bullock is doing oil painting classes on Zoom in a series, mm -hmm. right? That's paid for, uh, yeah. you know. And it so should be. That's, that's a great step. Absolutely, it should be. Uh, it's better time. Having like a Khan Academy or something like that for model horse people would be invaluable. I think so. I, I feel like there's enough people who cannot learn by reading a book um, that there are certain things. I won't ever do painting. Um, I, I do have plans for the book on painting, but again, I don't want to give away the answers on painting. Sure. But for, for molding, and, and we talked about why that I don't want to give away, but for molding, I think it's a little different. I think um, you need all the help you can get with molding. Right. <laughs> and, it's like baking. It's too, it's too, you know, it's too scientific. It's, you know. Yeah. Like it, it's not so much stylistic like art is, like the painting right. side is, where there's so much room for interpretation and you have to find out what's going to make you different from everybody else. I think molding, like you said, it is very this is the procedure. It needs to be this way in order for it to work. Um, and it doesn't matter who you are. Right. So I, I'm pretty excited to be able to share that because I do think it is a field, especially with all these new sculptors that we have coming up um, and new artists. And there's just no information. There's no books. There's no, you know, right. like I'm trying to get my webpage up so it gives them something. But I think a, a paid for video series would be very well received. Absolutely. And, and we're not taking a million bucks or anything, but it's like right. this pays for my learning, my time invested, not just in making the video, but in all of the knowledge that I have gathered to impart. So awesome. Okay, right. I think I'm done talking now. <laughs> you, have, you have to plug your work. That's the closing. You have to plug your work. You have to plug all your social media and your website oh and all that kind of stuff. You know, 
<laughs> Facebook is the great place to know um, what I'm doing at that moment. Um, like all the in progress little sneak peeks because I love to share. I, I just, I love to share. I can't, I'm so bad with surprises. Like you, I told you, keeping like, this reveal a secret was yeah. killing me. But um, I just love show and tell. So Facebook is where I put a lot of the in progress, a lot of the news. I do have to get my mailing list up and running again um, because I do think that it, Facebook is not all inclusive. There are several people who do not want to deal with social media and the mailing list is far more professional for that as far as releases go. Well, and its algorithm isn't reliable to get your, get stuff exactly. to people. Like right. the mailing list will be controlled by me through my servers. Um, I, I've got my program. It was up and running and then something weird happened. So I've got to fix out all the bugs so I can get it totally 100% before I release it. But um, Facebook for progress, and that is Aspen Lee Studios. And I, be I believe my name is attached to that, Jennifer L. Scott. Um, mm -hmm. So you can find it. It's got a profile picture of a little watercolory Aspen leaf that's bright yellow. So it's pretty easy to spot. Um, the website, www.aspenleafstudiosllc.com, yeah. is up to today has all of my finished piece photos up there. So if you just want some eye candy, I recommend it. Uh, it will also have a list of resins that are currently available and how they are available in the resin section. So I get a lot of emails like, oh, I wanna buy this horse. And it's like, well, he's not for sale. He's been sold out for two years, you know, or how do I buy this piece? So if you go to the resin or the website, the up-to-date what's available stuff is listed on there in the sales page and in the resin section. They're divided by categories. Um, so I highly recommend that for information. Otherwise, that's pretty much it for, for me on social media. So you don't um, do, you don't, I mean, I know you have an Insta, but you don't do your whole I do have an Insta. I, I don't do the models yet. Um, I actually started the Instagram as more of my personal sewing board. Like I quilt as a, as a side hobby. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, to the level I paint and sculpt at. So, Cause I, I can't, I, I have drive in me to always be is the best that I can. So it, it, it is pretty nice if you like looking at fabric art. Um, Oh, I love your quilted stuff. It's gorgeous. I mean, it, yeah. and it's really graphically pleasing. It's put together well, you know, and, and yeah, like it, it under it's just another outlook. Yeah. I, I saw the blanket you did for Nikki too, Nikki's baby. And it was just oh, yeah. fabulous. Well, and that's the fun thing about the quilting is that it's, it's not made to keep, it's made to give. Um, so all my stuff goes out. <laughs> uh, a lot of the times the really complicated pieces are for my mom because she always wants them. I do have one in the works. That has like 40 quilts. <laughs> Mom, I got this, this love from quilting um, from her. So she has, she's a full-time housewife um, and full-time quilter, basically. Like that, she just quilts, quilts, quilts. And the amount of quilts she has is crazy. But my Instagram is, is more for that. Uh, it's not the model horses. It might be in the future. I, I kind of like, not having that like I, I have the account so I can keep up with everybody else's stuff but right. I feel Facebook and the website are enough and I oh that is one thing I would like to ask artists to not rely solely on Facebook to please build websites because they are an archive that is reliable and searchable and mappable, like it, you can organize it. Um, and it is, is not relied by anybody else's algorithms. It's not right. It is under your control. Totally. You put whatever information you want out on it. And I, I just highly recommend it. I think, I, yeah, I think that's a great point because I think a lot of websites have fallen by the wayside for some people because they rely a hundred percent on Instagram or Facebook or something yeah. like that. It, it drives me nuts because I, I want to go to a place that I don't have to scroll through three years of history to right. see the one picture I'm after. Right. So. Awesome. So, yeah.
Yeah. All right, Jen, before you go, <laughs> before you go completely. I'm going to go like get a throw lozenge or something. <laughs> we appreciate you joining us. And, and it, it was such a great conversation and, you know, part demo, part reveal, part tour. Perfect. It was, it was great. much fun. I'm, I'm so glad that you had me on this. This was great. So I look forward to the next one now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, All thanks right. Jen and uh, Aspen Leaf Studio for joining us and, and showing her us her Pandora's uh, box of secrets. And we, we, uh, we know that um, she'll have a lot more wonderful stuff coming and she's going to have a sale at Briarfest and with those, uh, the reveal she showed today and a bunch more stuff. So stay tuned for that. Thanks, Jen. Stay tuned. Thank you. We'll see you.